Crime and Punishment, Disc 17. A boarding school, <laughs> a castle in the air, cried Katerina Ivanovna, her laugh ending in a cough. No, Rodion Romanovich, that dream is over. All have forsaken us. And that general, you know Rodion Romanovich, I threw an ink pot at him. It happened to be standing in the waiting room by the paper where you sign your name. I wrote my name, threw it at him, and ran away. Oh, the scoundrels, the scoundrels! But enough of them. Now I'll provide for the children myself. I won't bow down to anybody. She has had to bear enough for us, she pointed to Sonia. Polyanka, how much have you got? Show me. What, only two farthings? Oh, the mean wretches! They give us nothing, only run after us, putting their tongues out. There, what is that blockhead laughing at? She pointed to a man in the crowd. It's all because Kolya here is so stupid. I have such a bother with him. What do you want, Polyanka? Tell me in French. Parlez-moi français. Why, I've taught you. You know some phrases. Else how are you to show that you are of good family, well-brought-up children, and not at all like other organ-grinders? We aren't going to have a Punch and Judy show in the street, but to sing a genteel song. Ah, yes. What are we to sing? You keep putting me out, but we... You see, we are standing here, Radion Romanovich, to find something to sing and get money, something Kolya can dance to. For, as you can fancy, our performance is all impromptu. We must talk it over and rehearse it all thoroughly, and then we shall go to Nevsky where there are far more people of good society, and we shall be noticed at once. Lida knows my village, only nothing but my village, and everyone sings that. We must sing something far more genteel. Well, have you thought of anything, Polyanka? If only you'd help your mother. My memory's quite gone, or I should have thought of something. We really can't sing an huzzah. Ah, let us sing in French. Sank Su. I have taught it you. I have taught it you. And as it is in French, people will see at once that you are children of good family, and that will be much more touching. You might sing Marlborough sans va en guerre, for that's quite a child song and is sung as a lullaby in all the aristocratic houses. Marlborough sans va en guerre, ne sait quand reviendre. She began singing. But no, better sing Sang Su. Now, Kolya, your hands on your hips, make haste. And you, Lida, keep turning the other way, and Polyanka and I will sing and clap our hands. Sang Su, Sang Su, pour monter notre ménage. <coughs> Set your dress straight, Polyanka. It slipped down on your shoulders she observed, panting from coughing. Now it's particularly necessary to behave nicely and genteelly that all may see that you are well-born children. I said at the time that the bodice should be cut longer and made of two widths. It was your fault, Sonia, with your advice to make it shorter, and now you see the child is quite deformed by it. Why, you're all crying again. What's the matter, stupids? Come, Kolya, begin. Make haste. Make haste. Oh, what an unbearable child. Sank su, sank su. The policeman again. What do you want? The policeman was, indeed, forcing his way through the crowd. But at that moment a gentleman in civilian uniform and an overcoat, a solid-looking official of about fifty, with a decoration on his neck, which delighted Katerina Ivanovna and had its effect on the policeman, approached and without a word handed her a green three-rouble note. His face wore a look of genuine sympathy. Katerina Ivanovna took it and gave him a polite, even ceremonious bow. "'I thank you, honoured sir,' she began loftily. "'The causes that have induced us take the money, Polyanka. You see, there are generous and honourable people who are ready to help a poor gentlewoman in distress. You see, 
Honoured sir, these orphans of good family, I might even say of aristocratic connections, and that wretch of a general sat eating grouse, and stamped at my disturbing him. Your Excellency, I said, protect the orphans, for you knew my late husband, Semyon Zakharovich, and on the very day of his death the basest of scoundrels slandered his only daughter. That policeman again, protect me, she cried to the official. Why is that policeman edging up to me? We have only just run away from one of them. What do you want, fool? It's forbidden in the streets. You mustn't make a disturbance. It's your making a disturbance. It's just the same as if I were grinding an organ. What business is it of yours? You have to get a license for an organ, and you haven't got one. And in that way you collect a crowd. Where do you lodge? What? A license? wailed Katerina Ivanovna. I buried my husband today. What need of a license? Calm yourself, madam, calm yourself, began the official. Come along, I will escort you. This is no place for you in the crowd. You are ill. Honored sir, honored sir, you don't know, screamed Katerina Ivanovna. We are going to the Nevsky. Sonia, Sonia, where is she? She is crying, too. What's the matter with you all? Kolya, Lida, where are you going? She cried suddenly in alarm. Oh, silly children, Kolya, Lida, where are they off to? Kolya and Lida, scared out of their wits by the crowd and their mother's mad pranks, suddenly seized each other by the hand and ran off at the sight of the policeman who wanted to take them away somewhere. Weeping and wailing, poor Katerina Ivanovna ran after them. She was a piteous and unseemly spectacle as she ran, weeping and panting for breath. Sonia and Polyanka rushed after them. Bring them back! Bring them back, Sonia! Oh, stupid, ungrateful children! Polyanka, catch them! It's for your sakes I... She stumbled as she ran and fell down. She's cut herself. She's bleeding. Oh, dear, cried Sonia, bending over her. All ran up and crowded round. Raskolnikov and Lebeziatnikov were the first at her side. The official, too, hastened up, and behind him the policeman who muttered, Bother! with a gesture of impatience, feeling that the job was going to be a troublesome one. Move along, move along, he said to the crowd that pressed forward. "'She's dying!' someone shouted. "'She's gone out of her mind!' said another. "'Lord, have mercy upon us!' said a woman, crossing herself. "'Have they caught the little girl and the boy? "'They're being brought back. The elder ones got them. "'Ah, the naughty imps!' "'When they examined Katerina Ivanovna carefully, "'they saw that she had not cut herself against a stone, as Sonya thought.' but that the blood that stained the pavement red was from her chest. "'I've seen that before,' muttered the official to Raskolnikov and Lebeziatnikov. "'That's consumption. The blood flows and chokes the patient. I saw the same thing with a relative of my own not long ago. Nearly a pint of blood, all in a minute. What's to be done, though? She's dying.' "'This way, this way to my room,' Sonya implored. "'I live here.' See, that house, the second from here. Come to me, make haste. She turned from one to the other. Send for the doctor. Oh, dear. Thanks to the official's efforts, this plan was adopted. The policeman even helping to carry Katerina Ivanovna. She was carried to Sonia's room, almost unconscious, and laid on the bed. The blood was still flowing, but she seemed to be coming to herself. Raskolnikov, Lebeziatnikov, and the official accompanied Sonia into the room and were followed by the policeman, who first drove back the crowd, which followed to the very door. Polyenka came in, holding Kolya and Lida, who were trembling and weeping. Several persons came in, too, from the Kapyonomov's room. The landlord, a lame, one-eyed man of strange appearance, 
with whiskers and hair that stood up like a brush. His wife, a woman with an everlastingly scared expression, and several open-mouthed children with wonder-struck faces. Among these, Svidrigailov suddenly made his appearance. Raskolnikov looked at him with surprise, not understanding where he had come from, and not having noticed him in the crowd. A doctor and priest were spoken of. The official whispered to Raskolnikov that he thought it was too late now for the doctor, but he ordered him to be sent for. Kapirnaumov ran himself. Meanwhile, Katerina Ivanovna had regained her breath. The bleeding ceased for a time. She looked with sick but intent and penetrating eyes at Sonya, who stood pale and trembling, wiping the sweat from her brow with a handkerchief. At last she asked to be raised. They sat her up on the bed, supporting her on both sides. "'Where are the children?' she said in a faint voice. "'You've brought them, Polyanka? "'All the sillies. "'Why did you run away? Oh. "'Once more her parched lips were covered with blood. "'She moved her eyes, looking about her. "'So, that's how you live, Sonia. "'Never once have I been in your room.' She looked at her with a face of suffering. We have been your ruin, Sonia. Polyenka, Lida, Kolya, come here. Well, here they are, Sonia. Take them all. I hand them over to you. I've had enough. The ball is over. <coughs> Lay me down. Let me die in peace. They laid her back on the pillow. What? The priest? I don't want him. You haven't got a rouble to spare. I have no sins. God must forgive me without that. He knows how I have suffered. And if he won't forgive me, I don't care. She sank more and more into uneasy delirium. At times she shuddered, turned her eyes from side to side, recognized everyone for a minute, but at once sank into delirium again. Her breathing was hoarse and difficult. There was a sort of rattle in her throat. I said to him, Your Excellency, she ejaculated, gasping after each word, that Amalia Ludvigovna, ah, Lida, Kolya, hands on your hips, make haste, glisse, glisse, pas de basque, tap with your heels, be a graceful child, du hast der Mountain. Und Perlin. What next? That's the thing to sing. Du hast die schönsten Augen, Mädchen, was willst du mehr? What an idea. Was willst du mehr? What things the fool invents. Ah, yes. In the Heat of midday in the Vale of Dagestan. Ah, how I loved it. I loved that song to distraction, Polyinka. Your father, you know, used to sing it when we were engaged. Oh, those days. Oh, that's the thing for us to sing. How does it go? I've forgotten. Remind me, how was it? She was violently excited, and tried to sit up. At last, in a horribly hoarse, broken voice, she began shrieking and gasping at every word with a look of growing terror in the heat of midday, in the vale 
of Dagestan, with lead in my breast. Your Excellency, she wailed suddenly with a heart-rending scream and a flood of tears, protect the orphans. You have been their father's guest, one may say aristocratic. She started, regaining consciousness, and gazed at all with a sort of terror, but at once recognized Sonia. Sonia! Sonia! She articulated softly and caressingly, as though surprised to find her there. Sonia, darling, are you here too? They lifted her up again. Enough, it's over. Farewell, poor thing, I am done for. I am broken. She cried with vindictive despair. And her head fell heavily back on the pillow. She sank into unconsciousness again. But this time it didn't last long. Her pale, yellow, wasted face dropped back. Her mouth fell open. Her leg moved convulsively. She gave a deep, deep sigh and died. Sonia fell upon her, flung her arms about her, and remained motionless with her head pressed to the dead woman's wasted bosom. Polyenka threw herself at her mother's feet, kissing them and weeping violently. Though Kolya and Lida did not understand what had happened, they had a feeling that it was something terrible. They put their hands on each other's little shoulders, stared straight at one another, and both at once opened their mouths and began screaming. They were both still in their fancy dress, one in a turban, the other in the cap with the ostrich feather. And how did the certificate of merit come to be on the bed beside Katerina Ivanovna? It lay there by the pillow. Raskolnikov saw it. He walked away to the window. Lebeziatnikov skipped up to him. She is dead, he said. Rodion Romanovich, I must have two words with you, said Svidrigailov, coming up to them. Nebeziatnikov at once made room for him and delicately withdrew. Svidrigailov drew Raskolnikov further away. I will undertake all the arrangements, the funeral and that. You know it's a question of money, and as I told you, I have plenty to spare. I will put those two little ones and Polyenka into some good orphan asylum, and I will settle fifteen hundred roubles to be paid to each oncoming of age, so that Sofia Semyonovna need have no anxiety about them. And I will pull her out of the mud, too, for she is a good girl, isn't she? So tell Avdotya Romanovna that that is how I am spending her ten thousand. What is your motive for such benevolence? asked Raskolnikov. Ah, you skeptical person, laughed Svidrigailov. I told you I had no need of that money. Won't you admit that it's simply done from humanity? She wasn't a louse, you know. He pointed to the corner where the dead woman lay. Was she? Like some old pawnbroker woman? Come, you'll agree. Is Lujin to go on living and doing wicked things? Or is she to die? And if I didn't help them... Polyenka would go the same way. He said this with an air of a sort of gay, winking slyness, keeping his eyes fixed on Raskolnikov, who turned white and cold, hearing his own phrases spoken to Sonia. 
he quickly stepped back and looked wildly at Svidrigailov. "'How do you know?' he whispered, hardly able to breathe. "'Why, I lodge here at Madame Resslich's, the other side of the wall. "'Here is Kapir Naumov, and there lives Madame Resslich, an old and devoted friend of mine. "'I am a neighbor. "'You?' "'Yes,' continued Svidrigailov, shaking with laughter. "'I assure you on my honor, dear Odion Romanovich, "'that you have interested me enormously. "'I told you we should become friends. "'I foretold it. "'Well, here we have. "'And you will see what an accommodating person I am.' You'll see that you can get on with me. Part Six Chapter One A strange period began for Raskolnikov. It was as though a fog had fallen upon him and wrapped him in a dreary solitude from which there was no escape. Recalling that period long after, he believed that his mind had been clouded at times, and that it had continued so with intervals, till the final catastrophe. He was convinced that he had been mistaken about many things at that time, for instance as to the date of certain events. Anyway, when he tried later on to piece his recollections together, he learned a great deal about himself from what other people told him. He had mixed up incidents and had explained events as due to circumstances which existed only in his imagination. At times he was a prey to agonies of morbid uneasiness, amounting sometimes to panic. But he remembered, too, moments, hours, perhaps whole days, of complete apathy, which came upon him as a reaction from his previous terror, and might be compared with the abnormal insensibility sometimes seen in the dying. He seemed to be trying in that latter stage to escape from a full and clear understanding of his position. Certain essential facts which required immediate consideration were particularly irksome to him. How glad he would have been! to be free from some cares, the neglect of which would have threatened him with complete, inevitable ruin. He was particularly worried about Svidrigailov. He might be said to be permanently thinking of Svidrigailov. From the time of Svidrigailov's too menacing and unmistakable words in Sonya's room, at the moment of Katerina Ivanovna's death, the normal working of his mind seemed to break down. But although this new fact caused him extreme uneasiness, Raskolnikov was in no hurry for an explanation of it. At times, finding himself in a solitary and remote part of the town, in some wretched eating-house, sitting alone, lost in thought, hardly knowing how he had come there, he suddenly thought of Svidrigailov. He recognized suddenly, clearly, and with dismay, that he ought at once to come to an understanding with that man, and to make what terms he could. Walking outside the city gates one day, he positively imagined that they had fixed a meeting there, that he was waiting for Svidrigailov. Another time he woke up before daybreak lying on the ground under some bushes, and couldn't at first understand how he had come there. But during the two or three days after Katerina Ivanovna's death, he had two or three times met Svidrigailov at Sonya's lodging, where he had gone aimlessly for a moment. They exchanged a few words, and made no reference to the vital subject, as though they were tacitly agreed not to speak of it for a time. Katerina Ivanovna's body was still lying in the coffin. 
Sidrigailov was busy making arrangements for the funeral. Sonia, too, was very busy. At their last meeting, Svidrigailov informed Raskolnikov that he had made an arrangement, and a very satisfactory one, for Katerina Ivanovna's children, that he had, through certain connections, succeeded in getting hold of certain personages by whose help the three orphans could be at once placed in very suitable institutions, that the money he had settled on them had been of great assistance as it is much easier to place orphans with some property than destitute ones. He said something, too, about Sonia, and promised to come himself in a day or two to see Raskolnikov, mentioning that he would like to consult with him, that there were things they must talk over. This conversation took place in the passage on the stairs, Svidrigailov looked intently at Raskolnikov and suddenly, after a brief pause, dropping his voice, asked, "'But how is it, Rodion Romanovich? You don't seem yourself. You look and you listen, but you don't seem to understand. Cheer up. We'll talk things over. I am only sorry I have so much to do of my own business and other people's.' Ah, Rodion Romanovich, he added suddenly, what all men need is fresh air. Fresh air, more than anything. He moved to one side to make way for the priest and server who were coming up the stairs. They had come for the requiem service. By Svidrigailov's orders it was sung twice a day punctually. Svidrigailov went his way. Raskolnikov stood still a moment, thought, and followed the priest into Sonya's room. He stood at the door. They began quietly, slowly and mournfully singing the service. From his childhood, the thought of death and the presence of death had something oppressive and mysteriously awful and it was long since he had heard the requiem service. And there was something else here as well, too awful and disturbing. He looked at the children. They were all kneeling by the coffin. Polyanka was weeping. Behind them Sonya prayed softly and, as it were, timidly weeping. These last two days she hasn't said a word to me. She hasn't glanced at me, Raskolnikov thought suddenly. The sunlight was bright in the room. The incense rose in clouds. The priest read, Give rest, O Lord. Raskolnikov stayed all through the service. As he blessed them and took his leave, the priest looked round strangely. After the service, Raskolnikov went up to Sonya. She took both his hands and let her head sink on his shoulder. This slight friendly gesture bewildered Raskolnikov. It seemed strange to him that there was no trace of repugnance, no trace of disgust, no tremor in her hand. It was the furthest limit of self-abnegation. At least so he interpreted it. Sonia said nothing. Raskolnikov pressed her hand and went out. He felt very miserable. If it had been possible to escape to some solitude... He would have thought himself lucky, even if he had to spend his whole life there. But although he had almost always been by himself of late, he had never been able to feel alone. Sometimes he walked out of the town onto the high road. Once he had even reached a little wood. But the lonelier the place was, the more he seemed to be aware of an uneasy presence near him. It didn't frighten him, but greatly annoyed him, so that he made haste to return to the town, to mingle with the crowd, to enter restaurants and taverns, to walk in busy thoroughfares. There he felt easier, and even more solitary. One day at dusk he sat for an hour listening to songs in a tavern, and he remembered that he positively enjoyed it. But at last he had suddenly felt the same uneasiness again, as though his conscience smote him. Here I sit listening to singing. Is that what I ought to be doing? He thought. 
yet he felt at once that that was not the only cause of his uneasiness. There was something requiring immediate decision, but it was something he could not clearly understand or put into words. It was a hopeless tangle. No, better the struggle again, better Porfiry again, or Svidrigailov, better some challenge again, some attack, yes, yes, he thought. He went out of the tavern and rushed away almost at a run. The thought of Dunya and his mother suddenly reduced him almost to a panic. That night he woke up before morning among some bushes in Kriestovsky Island, trembling all over with fever. He walked home, and it was early morning when he arrived. After some hours' sleep the fever left him, but he woke up late, two o'clock in the afternoon. He remembered that Katerina Ivanovna's funeral had been fixed for that day and was glad that he was not present at it. Nastasia brought him some food. He ate and drank with appetite, almost with greediness. His head was fresher, and he was calmer than he had been for the last three days. He even felt a passing wonder at his previous attacks of panic. The door opened, and Razumikhin came in. Ah, he's eating, then he's not ill, said Razumikhin. He took a chair and sat down at the table opposite Raskolnikov. He was troubled and didn't attempt to conceal it. He spoke with evident annoyance, but without hurry or raising his voice. He looked as though he had some special fixed determination. Listen, he began resolutely. As far as I'm concerned, you may all go to hell, but from what I see it's clear to me that I can't make head or tail of it. Please don't think I've come to ask you questions. I don't want to know, hang it. If you begin telling me your secrets, I dare say I shouldn't stay to listen. I should go away, cursing. I have only come to find out once for all whether it's a fact that you are mad. There is a conviction in the air that you are mad, or very nearly so. I admit I've been disposed to that opinion myself, judging from your stupid, repulsive, and quite inexplicable actions— and from your recent behavior to your mother and sister. Only a monster or a madman could treat them as you have, so you must be mad. When did you see them last? Just now. Haven't you seen them since then? What have you been doing with yourself? Tell me, please. I've been to you three times already. Your mother has been seriously ill since yesterday. She had made up her mind to come to you. Avdotya Romanovna tried to prevent her. She wouldn't hear a word. If he is ill, if his mind is giving way, who can look after him like his mother, she said. We all came here together. We couldn't let her come alone all the way. We kept begging her to be calm. We came in. You weren't here. She sat down and stayed ten minutes while we stood waiting, in silence. She got up and said, If he's gone out... That is, if he is well and has forgotten his mother, it's humiliating and unseemly for his mother to stand at his door begging for kindness. She returned home and took to her bed. Now she is in a fever. I see, she said, that he has time for his girl. She means by your girl, Sofia Semyonovna, your betrothed or your mistress, I don't know. I went at once to Sofia Semyonovna's, for I wanted to know what was going on. I looked round, I saw the coffin, the children crying, and Sofia Semyonovna trying on them mourning dresses. No sign of you. I apologized, came away, and reported to Avdotya Romanovna. So, that's all nonsense, and you haven't got a girl. The most likely thing is that you are mad. But here you sit, guzzling boiled beef as though you'd not had a bite for three days. As far as that goes, mad men eat too. But though you have not said a word to me, yet you are not mad, that I'd swear. Above all, you are not mad, so you may go to hell, all of you. For there's some mystery, some secret about it, and I don't intend to worry my brains over your secrets. So I've simply come to swear at you, he finished, getting up, to relieve my mind, and I know what to do now. What do you mean to do now? What business is it of yours what I mean to do? You are going in for a drinking bout. How? How did you know? Why, it's pretty plain. 
Razumikhin paused for a minute. You always have been a very rational person, and you've never been mad. Never, he observed suddenly, with warmth. You're right. I shall drink. Goodbye. And he moved to go out. I was talking with my sister. The day before yesterday, I think it was. About you, Razumikhin. About me? But where can you have seen her the day before yesterday? Razumikhin stopped short and even turned a little pale. One could see that his heart was throbbing slowly and violently. She came here by herself, sat there and talked to me. She did, yes. What did you say to her? I mean, about me. I told her you were a very good, honest, and industrious man. I didn't tell her you love her because she knows that herself. She knows that herself? Well, it's pretty plain. Wherever I might go, whatever happened to me, you would remain to look after them. I, so to speak, give them into your keeping, Razumikhin. I say this because I know quite well how you love her and am convinced of the purity of your heart. I know that she too may love you, and perhaps does love you already. Now, decide for yourself, as you know best, whether you need go in for a drinking bout or not. Rodya. You see? Well, ah, damn it. But where do you mean to go? Of course, if it's all a secret, never mind. But I... I shall find out the secret. And I am sure that it must be some ridiculous nonsense and that you've made it all up. Anyway, you are a capital fellow, a capital fellow. That was just what I wanted to add, only you interrupted. That that was a very good decision of yours not to find out these secrets. Leave it to time. Don't worry about it. You'll know it all in time when it must be. Yesterday a man said to me that what a man needs is fresh air. Fresh air, fresh air. I mean to go to him directly to find out what he meant by that. Razumikhin stood lost in thought and excitement, making a silent conclusion. He's a political conspirator. He must be. And he's on the eve of some desperate step, that's certain. It can only be that, and... And Dunya knows, he thought suddenly. So Avdotya Romanovna comes to see you, he said, weighing each syllable. And you're going to see a man who says we need more air. And so, of course, that letter, that too must have something to do with it he concluded to himself. What letter? She got a letter today. It upset her very much, very much indeed. Too much so. I began speaking of you. She begged me not to. Then, then she said that perhaps we should very soon have to part. Then she began warmly thanking me for something. Then she went to her room and locked herself in. She got a letter? Raskolnikov asked thoughtfully. Yes, and you didn't know? Huh. They were both silent. Goodbye, Rodion. There was a time, brother, when I... Never mind. Goodbye. You see, there was a time... Well, goodbye. I must be off, too. I'm not going to drink. There's no need now. That's all stuff. He hurried out. But when he had almost closed the door behind him, he suddenly opened it again and said, looking away, Oh, by the way, do you remember that murder, you know, Porfiris, that old woman? Do you know the murderer has been found? He's confessed and given the proofs. It's one of those very workmen, the painter. Just imagine. Do you remember I defended them here? Would you believe it, all that scene of fighting and laughing with his companion on the stairs while the porter and the two witnesses were going up, he got up on purpose, 
to disarm suspicion. The cunning, the presence of mind of the young dog. One can hardly credit it, but it's his own explanation. He's confessed it all. And what a fool I was about it. Well, he's simply a genius of hypocrisy and resourcefulness in disarming the suspicions of the lawyers. So there's nothing much to wonder at, I suppose. Of course, people like that are always possible. And the fact that he couldn't keep up the character but confessed makes him easier to believe in. But what a fool I was! I was frantic on their side. Tell me, please, from whom did you hear that, and why does it interest you so? Raskolnikov asked with unmistakable agitation. What next? You ask me why it interests me. Well, I heard it from Porfiry, among others. It was from him I heard almost all about it. From Porfiry? From Porfiry. What, what did he say? Raskolnikov asked in dismay. He gave me a capital explanation of it, psychologically, after his fashion. He explained it. Explained it himself? Yes. Yes. Goodbye. I'll tell you all about it another time, but now I'm busy. There was a time when I fancied... But no matter. Another time. What need is there for me to drink now? You've made me drunk without wine. I am drunk, Rodya. Goodbye, I'm going. I'll come again very soon. He went out. He's a political conspirator, there's not a doubt about it, Razumikhin decided as he slowly descended the stairs. And he's drawn his sister in. That's quite, quite in keeping with Avdotya Romanovna's character. There are interviews between them. She hinted at it, too. So many of her words and hints bear that meaning. And how else can all this tangle be explained? Hm. And I was almost thinking, Good heavens, what I thought! Yes, I took leave of my senses, and I wronged him. It was his doing under the lamp in the corridor that day. Phew! What a crude... Nasty, vile idea on my part. Good old Nikolai confessed. And how clear it all is now. His illness, then. All his strange actions. Before this, in the university, how morose he used to be, how gloomy. But what's the meaning now of that letter? There's something in that, too, perhaps. Whom was it from? I suspect... No, I must find out. He thought of Dunya, realizing all he had heard, and his heart throbbed, and he suddenly broke into a run. As soon as Razumikhin went out, Raskolnikov got up, turned to the window, walked into one corner and then into another, as though forgetting the smallness of his room, and sat down again on the sofa. He felt, so to speak, renewed. Again the struggle. So a means of escape had come. Yes, a means of escape had come. It had been too stifling, too cramping. The burden had been too agonizing. A lethargy had come upon him at times. From the moment of the scene with Nikolai at Porfiry's, he had been suffocating, penned in, without hope of escape. After Nikolai's confession, on that very day had come the scene with Sonia. His behavior and his last words had been utterly unlike anything he could have imagined beforehand. He had grown feebler, instantly and fundamentally. And he had agreed at the time with Sonia. He had agreed in his heart. He could not go on living alone with such a thing on his mind. And Svidrigailov was a riddle. He worried him, that was true, but somehow not on the same point. He might still have a struggle to come with Svidrigailov. Svidrigailov, too, might be a means of escape, but Porfiry was a different matter. 
and so Porfiry himself had explained it to Razumihin, had explained it psychologically. He had begun bringing in his damned psychology again. Porfiry? But to think that Porfiry should, for one moment, believe that Nikolai was guilty, after what had passed between them before Nikolai's appearance, after that tete-a-tete -tete interview, which could have only one explanation. During those days, Raskolnikov had often recalled passages in that scene with Porfiry. He couldn't bear to let his mind rest on it. Such words, such gestures had passed between them. They had exchanged such glances. Things had been said in such a tone and had reached such a pass that Nikolai, whom Porfiry had seen through at the first word, at the first gesture, could not have shaken his conviction. And to think that even Razumihin had begun to suspect. The scene in the corridor under the lamp had produced its effect then. He had rushed to Porfiry. But what had induced the latter to deceive him like that? What had been his object in putting Razumihin off with Nikolai? He must have some plan. There was some design, but what was it? It was true that a long time had passed since that morning, too long a time, and no sight nor sound of Porfiry. Well, that was a bad sign. Raskolnikov took his cap and went out of the room, still pondering. It was the first time for a long while that he had felt clear in his mind, at least. I must settle Svidrigailov, he thought, and as soon as possible. He, too, seems to be waiting for me to come to him of my own accord. And at that moment... There was such a rush of hate in his weary heart that he might have killed either of those two, Porfiry or Svidrigailov. At least he felt that he would be capable of doing it later, if not now. We shall see. We shall see, he repeated to himself. But no sooner had he opened the door than he stumbled upon Porfiry himself in the passage. He was coming in to see him. Raskolnikov was dumbfounded for a minute, but only for one minute. Strange to say, he was not very much astonished at seeing Porfiry and scarcely afraid of him. He was simply startled, but was quickly, instantly on his guard. Perhaps this will mean the end. But how could Porfiry have approached so quietly like a cat so that he heard nothing? Could he have been listening at the door? You didn't expect a visitor, Rodion Romanovich, Porfiry explained, laughing. I've been meaning to look in a long time. I was passing by and thought, why not go in for five minutes? Are you going out? I won't keep you long. Just let me have one cigarette. Sit down, Porfiry Petrovich, sit down. Raskolnikov gave his visitor a seat with so pleased and friendly an expression that he would have marveled at himself if he could have seen it. The last moment had come. The last drops had to be drained. So a man will sometimes go through half an hour of mortal terror with a brigand, yet when the knife is at his throat at last, he feels no fear. Raskolnikov seated himself directly facing Porfiry, and looked at him without flinching. Porfiry screwed up his eyes and began lighting a cigarette. Speak, speak, seemed as though it would burst from Raskolnikov's heart. Come, why don't you speak? Chapter Two Ah, these cigarettes, Porfiry Petrovitch ejaculated at last, having lighted one. They are pernicious, positively pernicious, and yet I can't give them up. 
I cough, I begin to have tickling in my throat and a difficulty in breathing. You know I am a coward. I went lately to Dr. B. He always gives at least half an hour to each patient. He positively laughed, looking at me. He sounded me. Tobacco's bad for you, he said. Your lungs are affected. But how am I to give it up? What is there to take its place? I don't drink. That's the mischief. <laughs> that I don't. Everything is relative, Rodion Romanovich. Everything is relative. Why, he's playing his professional tricks again, Raskolnikov thought with disgust. All the circumstances of their last interview suddenly came back to him, and he felt a rush of the feeling that had come upon him then. I came to see you the day before yesterday, in the evening, you didn't know? Porfiry Petrovitch went on, looking round the room. I came into this very room. I was passing by, just as I did today, and I thought I'd return your call. I walked in, as your door was wide open, I looked round, waited, and went out, without leaving my name with your servant. Don't you lock your door? Raskolnikov's face grew more and more gloomy. Porfiry seemed to guess his state of mind. I've come to have it out with you, Rodion Romanovich, my dear fellow. I owe you an explanation, and must give it to you. He continued with a slight smile, just patting Raskolnikov's knee. But almost at the same instant a serious and careworn look came into his face. To his surprise Raskolnikov saw a touch of sadness in it. He had never seen and never suspected such an expression in his face. A strange scene passed between us last time we met, Radion Romanovich. Our first interview, too, was a strange one, but then... And one thing after another, this is the point. I have perhaps acted unfairly to you, I feel it. Do you remember how we parted? Your nerves were unhinged, and your knees were shaking, and so were mine. And you know, our behaviour was unseemly, even ungentlemanly. And yet we are gentlemen, above all, in any case. Gentlemen, that must be understood. Do you remember what we came to? It was quite indecorous. What is he up to? What does he take me for? Raskolnikov asked himself in amazement, raising his head and looking with open eyes on Porfiry. I have decided. Openness is better between us, Porfiry Petrovitch went on turning his head away and dropping his eyes as though unwilling to disconcert his former victim, and as though disdaining his former wiles. Yes, such suspicions and such scenes cannot continue for long. Nikolai put a stop to it, or I don't know what we might not have come to. That damned workman was sitting at the time in the next room. Can you realize that? You know that, of course. And I am aware that he came to you afterwards. But what you supposed then was not true. I had not sent for anyone. I had made no kind of arrangements. You ask why I hadn't? What shall I say to you? It had all come upon me so suddenly. I had scarcely sent for the porters, you noticed them as you went out, I dare say, an idea flashed upon me. I was firmly convinced at the time, you see, Rodion Romanovich. Come, I thought, even if I let one thing slip for a time, I shall get hold of something else. I shan't lose what I want anyway. You are nervously irritable, Rodion Romanovich, by temperament. It's out of proportion with other qualities of your heart and character, which, I flatter myself, I have to some extent divined. 
Of course I did reflect, even then, that it does not always happen that a man gets up and blurts out his whole story. It does happen sometimes, if you make a man lose all patience, though even then it's rare. I was capable of realizing that. If I only had a fact, I thought, the least little fact to go upon, something I could lay hold of, something tangible, not merely psychological. For if a man is guilty, you must be able to get something substantial out of him. One may reckon upon most surprising results indeed. I was reckoning on your temperament, Radion Romanovitch, on your temperament above all things. I had great hopes of you at that time. But what are you driving at now? Raskolnikov muttered at last, asking the question without thinking. "'What is he talking about?' he wondered distractedly. "'Does he really take me to be innocent?' "'What am I driving at?' "'I've come to explain myself. "'I consider it my duty, so to speak. "'I want to make clear to you how the whole business, the whole misunderstanding arose.' I've caused you a great deal of suffering, Rodion Romanovitch. I'm not a monster. I understand what it must mean for a man who has been unfortunate, but who is proud, imperious, and above all, impatient, to have to bear such treatment. I regard you, in any case, as a man of noble character, and not without elements of magnanimity, though I don't agree with all your convictions. I wanted to tell you this first, frankly and quite sincerely, for above all I don't want to deceive you. When I made your acquaintance I felt attracted by you. Perhaps you will laugh at my saying so. You have a right to. I know you disliked me from the first, and indeed you've no reason to like me. You may think what you like. But I desire now to do all I can to efface that impression, and to show that I am a man of heart and conscience. I speak sincerely. Porfiry Petrovitch made a dignified pause. Raskolnikov felt a rush of renewed alarm. The thought that Porfiry believed him to be innocent began to make him uneasy. "'It's scarcely necessary to go over everything in detail,' Porfiry Petrovitch went on. "'Indeed, I could scarcely attempt it. "'To begin with, there were rumours. "'Through whom, how, and when those rumours came to me, "'and how they affected you, I need not go into.' My suspicions were aroused by a complete accident, which might just as easily not have happened. What was it? Hm. I believe there is no need to go into that either. Those rumours and that accident led to one idea in my mind. I admit it openly, for one may as well make a clean breast of it. I was the first to suspect you. The old woman's notes on the pledges and the rest of it, that all came to nothing. Yours was one of a hundred. I happened, too, to hear of the scene at the office, from a man who described it capitally, unconsciously reproducing the scene with great vividness. It was just one thing after another, Odion Romanovich, my dear fellow. How could I avoid being brought to certain ideas? From a hundred rabbits you can't make a horse— a hundred suspicions don't make a proof, as the English proverb says, but that's only from the rational point of view. You can't help being partial, for after all a lawyer is only human. I thought, too, of your article in that journal. Do you remember? On your first visit we talked of it? I jeered at you at the time, but that was only to lead you on. I repeat, Rodion Romanovich. You are ill and impatient. 
that you were bold, headstrong, in earnest, and had felt a great deal I recognized long before. I, too, have felt the same, so that your article seemed familiar to me. It was conceived on sleepless nights, with a throbbing heart, in ecstasy and suppressed enthusiasm. And that proud, suppressed enthusiasm in young people is dangerous. I jeered at you then, but let me tell you that as a literary amateur, I am awfully fond of such first essays, full of the heat of youth. There is a mistiness and a chord vibrating in the mist. Your article is absurd and fantastic, but there's a transparent sincerity, a youthful, incorruptible pride, and the daring of despair in it. It's a gloomy article, but that's what's fine in it. I read your article and put it aside, thinking, as I did, so that man won't go the common way. Well, I ask you, after that as a preliminary, how could I help being carried away by what followed? Oh, dear, I'm not saying anything. I am not making any statement now. I simply noted it at the time. What is there in it, I reflected? There is nothing in it. There is really nothing, and perhaps absolutely nothing. And it's not at all the thing for the prosecutor to let himself be carried away by notions. Here I have Nikolai on my hands, with actual evidence against him. You may think what you like of it, but it's evidence— he brings in his psychology, too. One has to consider him, too, for it's a matter of life and death. Why am I explaining this to you? That you may understand, and not blame my malicious behavior on that occasion. It was not malicious, I assure you. <laughs> Do you suppose I didn't come to search your room at the time? I did, I did. <laughs> I was here when you were lying ill in bed. Not officially. Not in my own person, but I was here. Your room was searched to the last thread at the first suspicion. But, umsonst. I thought to myself, now that man will come. Will come of himself, and quickly, too. If he's guilty, he's sure to come. Another man wouldn't, but he will. And you remember how Mr. Razumikhin began discussing the subject with you? We arranged that to excite you. So we purposely spread rumors that he might discuss the case with you. And Razumikhin is not a man to restrain his indignation. Mr. Zamyatov was tremendously struck by your anger and your open daring. Think of blurting out in a restaurant, I killed her. It was too daring too reckless. I thought to myself, if he is guilty, he will be a formidable opponent. That was what I thought at the time. I was expecting you. But you simply bowled Zamyatov over, and, well, you see, it all lies in this, that this damnable psychology can be taken two ways. Well, I kept expecting you, and so it was. You came. My heart was fairly throbbing. Ugh! Now, why need you have come? Your laughter, too, as you came in, do you remember? I saw it all plain as daylight, but if I hadn't expected you so specially, I should not have noticed anything in your laughter. You see what influence a mood has— Mr. Razumikhin, then— Ah, that stone, that stone under which the things were hidden. I seem to see it somewhere in a kitchen garden. It was in a kitchen garden, you told Zamyatov, and afterwards you repeated that in my office. And when we began picking your article to pieces, how you explained it! One could take every word of yours in two senses, 
as though there were another meaning hidden. So, in this way, Rodion Romanovich, I reached the furthest limit, and knocking my head against a post, I pulled myself up, asking myself what I was about. After all, I said, you can take it all in another sense if you like, and it's more natural so, indeed. I couldn't help admitting it was more natural. I was bothered. No, I'd better get hold of some little fact, I said. So, when I heard of the bell ringing, I held my breath and was all in a tremor. Here is my little fact, thought I, and I didn't think it over. I simply wouldn't. I would have given a thousand roubles at that minute to have seen you with my own eyes when you walked a hundred paces beside that workman after he had called you murderer to your face, and you did not dare to ask him a question all the way. And then what about your trembling? What about your bell ringing in your illness in semi-delirium? And so, Rodion Romanovich, can you wonder that I played such pranks on you? And what made you come at that very minute? Someone seemed to have sent you, by God. And if Nikolai had not parted us, and do you remember Nikolai at the time? Do you remember him clearly? It was a thunderbolt, a regular thunderbolt. And how I met him. I didn't believe in the thunderbolt, not for a minute. You could see it for yourself, and how could I? Even afterwards, when you had gone, and he began making very, very plausible answers on certain points, so that I was surprised at him myself, even then, I didn't believe his story. You see what it is to be as firm as a rock? No, thought I, Morgan Free. What has Nikolai got to do with it? Razumikhin told me just now that you think Nikolai guilty and had yourself assured him of it. His voice failed him, and he broke off. He had been listening in indescribable agitation as this man who had seen through and through him went back upon himself. He was afraid of believing it, and didn't believe it. In those still ambiguous words, he kept eagerly looking for something more definite and conclusive. "'Mr. Razumikhin!' cried Porfiry Petrovitch, seeming glad of a question from Raskolnikov, who had till then been silent. <laughs> "'But I had to put Mr. Razumikhin off. To his company three is none. Mr. Razumikhin is not the right man. Besides, he is an outsider. He came running to me with a pale face— but never mind him. Why bring him in? To return to Nikolai. Would you like to know what sort of a type he is, how I understand him, that is? To begin with, he is still a child, and not exactly a coward, but something by way of an artist. Really, don't laugh at my describing him so. He is innocent and responsive to influence. He has a heart and is a fantastic fellow. He sings and dances. He tells stories, they say, so that people come from other villages to hear him. He attends school, too, and laughs till he cries if you hold up a finger to him. He will drink himself senseless, not as a regular vice, but at times when people treat him like a child. And he's told, too, then, without knowing it himself, for how can it be stealing if one picks it up? And do you know he is a Raskolnik? or rather a dissenter, a member of one of those religious sects, the Wanderers. There have been wanderers in his family, and he was for two years in his village under the spiritual guidance of a certain elder. I learned all this from Nikolai and from his fellow villagers. And what's more, he wanted to wander into the wilderness. He was full of fervor, prayed at night, read the old books, the true ones, and read himself crazy. Petersburg had a great effect upon him, especially the women and the wine. He responds to everything, and he forgot the elder and all that. I learned 
that an artist here took a fancy to him, and used to go and see him. And now this business came upon him. Well, he was frightened. He tried to hang himself. He ran away. How can one get over the idea the people have of Russian legal proceedings? The very word trial frightens some of them. Whose fault is it? We shall see what the new juries will do. God grant they do good. Well, in prison, it seems, he remembered the holy elder. The Bible, too, made its appearance again. Do you know, Rodion Romanovich, the force of the word suffering among some of these people? It's not a question of suffering for someone's benefit, but simply one must suffer. If they suffer at the hands of the authorities, so much the better. In my time, there was a very meek and mild prisoner who spent a whole year in prison, always reading his Bible on the stove at night, and he read himself crazy. And so, crazy, do you know that one day, apropos of nothing, he seized a brick and flung it at the governor, though he had done him no harm? And the way he threw it, too, aimed it a yard on one side on purpose for fear of hurting him. Well, we know what happens to a prisoner who assaults an officer with a weapon. So he took his suffering upon himself. So I suspect now that Nikolai wants to take his suffering upon himself, or something of the sort. I know it for certain from facts, indeed. Only he doesn't know that I know. What? You don't admit that there are such fantastic people among the peasants? Lots of them. The elder now has begun influencing him, especially since he tried to hang himself. But he'll come and tell me all himself. You think he'll hold out? Wait a bit. He'll take his words back. I am waiting from hour to hour for him to come and abjure his evidence. I have come to like that Nikolai, and am studying him in detail. And what do you think? <laughs> he answered me very plausibly on some points. He obviously had collected some evidence and prepared himself cleverly. But on other points, he is simply at sea, knows nothing, and doesn't even suspect that he doesn't know. This ends Disc 17. Crime and Punishment, Disc 18. No, Radion Romanovich. Nikolai doesn't come in. This is a fantastic, gloomy business, a modern case, an incident of today when the heart of man is troubled, when the phrase is quoted that blood renews, when comfort is preached as the aim of life. Here we have bookish dreams, a heart unhinged by theories, here we see resolution in the first stage, but resolution of a special kind. He resolved to do it, like jumping over a precipice, or from a bell tower, and his legs shook as he went to the crime. He forgot to shut the door after him, and murdered two people for a theory. He committed the murder, and couldn't take the money, and what he did manage to snatch up, he hid under a stone. It wasn't enough for him to suffer agony behind the door while they battered at the door and rung the bell, no, 
he had to go to the empty lodging. Half delirious, to recall the bell ringing, he wanted to feel the cold shiver over again. Well, that we grant was through illness. But consider this. He is a murderer, but looks upon himself as an honest man, despises others, poses as injured innocence. No, that's not the work of a Nikolai, my dear Radion Romanovich. All that had been said before had sounded so like a recantation that these words were too great a shock. Raskolnikov shuddered as though he had been stabbed. Then, who then is the murderer? He asked in a breathless voice, unable to restrain himself. Porfiry Petrovitch sank back in his chair as though he were amazed at the question. Who is the murderer? He repeated as though unable to believe his ears. Why, you, Radion Romanovich, you are the murderer, he added almost in a whisper, in a voice of genuine conviction. Raskolnikov leapt from the sofa, stood up for a few seconds and sat down again without uttering a word. His face twitched convulsively. Your lip is twitching. "'Just as it did before,' Porfiry Petrovitch observed almost sympathetically. "'You've been misunderstanding me, I think, Rodion Romanovitch,' he added after a brief pause. "'That's why you are so surprised. "'I came on purpose to tell you everything and deal openly with you. "'It was not I murdered her,' Raskolnikov whispered like a frightened child caught in the act. No, it was you, you, Rodion Romanovich, and no one else, Porfiry whispered sternly with conviction. They were both silent, and the silence lasted strangely long, about ten minutes. Raskolnikov put his elbow on the table and passed his fingers through his hair. Porfiry Petrovitch sat quietly, waiting. Suddenly Raskolnikov looked scornfully at Porfiry. You are at your old tricks again, Porfiry Petrovitch. Your old method again. I wonder you don't get sick of it. Oh, stop that. What does that matter now? It would be a different matter if there were witnesses present, but we are whispering alone. You see yourself that I have not come to chase and capture you like a hare. Whether you confess it or not is nothing to me now. For myself, I am convinced without it. If so, what did you come for? Raskolnikov asked irritably. I ask you the same question again. If you consider me guilty, why don't you take me to prison? Oh, that's your question. I will answer you point for point. In the first place, to arrest you so directly is not to my interest. How so? If you are convinced, you ought... Ah, what if I am convinced? That's only my dream for the time. Why should I put you in safety? You know that's it, since you ask me to do it. If I confront you with that workman, for instance... And you say to him, were you drunk or not? Who saw me with you? I simply took you to be drunk and you were drunk too. Well, what could I answer? Especially as your story is a more likely one than his. For there's nothing but psychology to support his evidence. That's almost unseemly with his ugly mug. While you hit the mark exactly for the rascal, is an inveterate drunkard, and notoriously so. And I have myself admitted candidly several times already that that psychology can be taken in two ways, and that the second way is stronger. 
and looks far more probable, and that apart from that I have as yet nothing against you. And though I shall put you in prison, and indeed have come, quite contrary to etiquette, to inform you of it beforehand, yet I tell you frankly, also contrary to etiquette, that it won't be to my advantage. Well, secondly, I've come to you because— Yes, yes, secondly— Raskolnikov was listening, breathless. Because, as I told you just now, I consider I owe you an explanation. I don't want you to look upon me as a monster, as I have a genuine liking for you. You may believe me or not. And in the third place, I've come to you with a direct and open proposition. That you should surrender and confess. It will be infinitely more to your advantage, and to my advantage too, for my task will be done. Well, is this open on my part or not? Raskolnikov thought a minute. Listen, Porfiry Petrovitch, you said just now you have nothing but psychology to go on. Yet now you've gone on to mathematics. Well, what if you are mistaken yourself now? No, Rodion Romanovich, I am not mistaken. I have a little fact even then. Providence sent it to me. What little fact? I won't tell you what, Rodion Romanovich. And in any case, I haven't the right to put it off any longer. I must arrest you, so think it over. It makes no difference to me now, and so I speak only for your sake. Believe me, it will be better, Rodion Romanovich. Raskolnikov smiled malignantly. That's not simply ridiculous, it's positively shameless. Why, even if I were guilty, which I don't admit, what reason should I have to confess when you tell me yourself that I shall be in greater safety in prison? Ah, Rodion Romanovich, don't put too much faith in words. Perhaps prison will not be altogether a restful place. That's only theory, and my theory. And what authority am I for you? Perhaps, too, even now I am hiding something from you. I can't lay bare everything. <laughs> and how can you ask what advantage? Don't you know how it would lessen your sentence? You would be confessing at a moment when another man has taken the crime on himself, and so has muddled the whole case. Consider that. I swear before God that I will so arrange that your confession shall come as a complete surprise. We will make a clean sweep of all these psychological points, of all suspicion against you so that your crime will appear to have been something like an aberration. For in truth it was an aberration. I am an honest man, Rodion Romanovich, and will keep my word. Raskolnikov maintained a mournful silence and let his head sink dejectedly. He pondered a long while and at last smiled again, but his smile was sad and gentle. No, he said, apparently abandoning all attempt to keep up appearances with Porfiry. It's not worth it. I don't care about lessening the sentence. That's just what I was afraid of, Porfiry cried warmly, and as it seemed involuntarily. That's just what I feared, that you wouldn't care about the mitigation of sentence. Raskolnikov looked sadly and expressively at him. Ah! Don't disdain life, Porfiry went on. You have a great deal of it still before you. How can you say you don't want a mitigation of sentence? You are an impatient fellow. A great deal of what lies before me? Of life. What sort of prophet are you? Do you know much about it? Seek and ye shall find. This may be 
God's means for bringing you to him. And it's not forever the bondage. The time will be shortened, laughed Raskolnikov. Why, is it the bourgeois disgrace you are afraid of? It may be that you are afraid of it without knowing it because you are young. But anyway, you shouldn't be afraid of giving yourself up and confessing. Ah, hang it, Raskolnikov whispered with loathing and contempt, as though he didn't want to speak aloud. He got up again as though he meant to go away, but sat down again in evident despair. Hang it if you like. You've lost faith, and you think that I am grossly flattering you. But how long has your life been? How much do you understand? You made up a theory, and then were ashamed that it broke down and turned out to be not at all original. It turned out something base, that's true. But you are not hopelessly base, by no means so base. At least you didn't deceive yourself for long. You went straight to the furthest point at one bound. How do I regard you? I regard you as one of those men who would stand and smile at their torturer while he cuts their entrails out, if only they have found faith or God. Find it, and you will live. You have long needed a change of air. Suffering, too, is a good thing. Suffer! Maybe Nikolai is right in wanting to suffer. I know you don't believe in it. But don't be overwise. Fling yourself straight into life, without deliberation. Don't be afraid. The flood will bear you to the bank and set you safe on your feet again. What bank? How can I tell? I only believe that you have long life before you. I know that you take all my words now for a set speech prepared beforehand. But maybe you will remember them after. They may be of use some time. That's why I speak. It's as well that you only killed the old woman. If you'd invented another theory, you might perhaps have done something a thousand times more hideous. You ought to thank God, perhaps. How do you know? Perhaps God is saving you for something. But keep a good heart and have less fear. Are you afraid of the great expiation before you? No, it would be shameful to be afraid of it. Since you have taken such a step, you must harden your heart. There is justice in it. You must fulfill the demands of justice. I know that you don't believe it, but indeed life will bring you through. You will live it down in time. What you need now is fresh air, fresh air, fresh air. Raskolnikov positively started. But who are you? What prophet are you? From the height of what majestic calm do you proclaim these words of wisdom? Who am I? I am a man with nothing to hope for, that's all. A man perhaps of feeling and sympathy, maybe of some knowledge too, but my day is over. But you are a different matter. There is life waiting for you. Though who knows, maybe your life, too, will pass off in smoke and come to nothing. Come, what does it matter that you will pass into another class of men? It's not comfort you regret with your heart. Whatever that perhaps no one will see you for so long, it's not time but yourself that will decide that. Be the sun, and all will see you. The sun has, before all, to be the sun. Why are you smiling again? At my being such a shiller? I bet you're imagining that I am trying to get round you by flattery. Well, perhaps I am. <laughs> perhaps you'd better not believe my word. Perhaps you'd better never believe it altogether. 
I'm made that way, I confess it. But let me add, you can judge for yourself, I think, how far I am a base sort of man, and how far I am honest. When do you mean to arrest me? Well, I can let you walk about another day or two. Think it over, my dear fellow, and pray to God. It's more in your interest, believe me. And what if I run away? asked Raskolnikov with a strange smile. No, you won't run away. A peasant would run away. A fashionable dissenter would run away, the flunky of another man's thought. For you've only to show him the end of your little finger, and he'll be ready to believe in anything for the rest of his life. But you've ceased to believe in your theory already. What will you run away with? And what would you do in hiding? It would be hateful and difficult for you. And what you need more than anything in life is a definite position, an atmosphere to suit you. And what sort of atmosphere would you have? If you ran away, you'd come back to yourself. You can't get on without us. And if I put you in prison? Say you've been there a month or two or three. Remember my word. You'll confess of yourself, and perhaps to your own surprise. You won't know an hour beforehand that you are coming with a confession. I am convinced that you will decide to take your suffering. You don't believe my words now, but you'll come to it of yourself. For suffering, Rodion Romanovich, is a great thing. Never mind my having grown fat, I know all the same. Don't laugh at it. There's an idea in suffering. Nikolai is right. No, you won't run away, Rodion Romanovich. Raskolnikov got up and took his cap. Porfiry Petrovich also rose. Are you going for a walk? The evening will be fine, if only we don't have a storm. Though it would be a good thing to freshen the air. He too took his cap. Porfiry Petrovich, please don't take up the notion that I have confessed to you today. As Konikov pronounced with sullen insistence, you're a strange man, and I have listened to you from simple curiosity. But I have admitted nothing, remember that. Oh, I know that. I remember. Look at him, he's trembling. Don't be uneasy, my dear fellow. Have it your own way. Walk about a bit. You won't be able to walk too far. If anything happens, I have one request to make of you, he added, dropping his voice. It's an awkward one, but important. If anything were to happen, though indeed I don't believe in it and think you quite incapable of it, Yet in case you were taken during these forty or fifty hours with the notion of putting an end to the business in some other way, in some fantastic fashion, laying hands on yourself, it's an absurd proposition, but you must forgive me for it, do leave a brief but precise note, only two lines, and mention the stone. It will be more generous. Come, till we meet. Good thoughts and sound decisions to you. Porfiry went out, stooping and avoiding looking at Raskolnikov. The latter went to the window and waited with irritable impatience till he calculated that Porfiry had reached the street and moved away. Then he too went hurriedly out of the room. Chapter 3 He hurried to Svidrigailov's. What he had to hope from that man he didn't know. But that man had some hidden power over him. Having once recognized this, he couldn't rest, and now the time had come. On the way, one question particularly worried him. Had Svidrigailov been to Porfiry's? As far as he could judge, he would swear to it that he had not. 
he pondered again and again, went over Porfiry's visit. No, he hadn't been. Of course he hadn't. But if he hadn't been yet, would he go? Meanwhile, for the present, he fancied he wouldn't. Why? He couldn't have explained, but if he could, he would not have wasted much thought over it at the moment. It all worried him, and at the same time he could not attend to it. Strange to say, none would have believed it, perhaps, but he only felt a faint, vague anxiety about his immediate future. Another, much more important anxiety tormented him. It concerned himself, but in a different, more vital way. Moreover, he was conscious of immense moral fatigue, though his mind was working better that morning than it had done of late. And was it worth while, after all that had happened, to contend with these new trivial difficulties? Was it worth while, for instance, to maneuver that Svidrigailov should not go to Porfiry's? Was it worth while to investigate, to ascertain the facts, to waste time? over anyone like Svidrigailov. Oh, how sick he was of it all! And yet he was hastening to Svidrigailov. Could he be expecting something new from him? Information or means of escape? Men will catch at straws. Was it destiny or some instinct bringing them together? Perhaps it was only fatigue despair. Perhaps it was not Svidrigailov, but some other whom he needed, and Svidrigailov had simply presented himself by chance. Sonia? But what should he go to Sonia for now, to beg her tears again? He was afraid of Sonia, too. Sonia stood before him as an irrevocable sentence. He must go his own way, or hers. At that moment especially he did not feel equal to seeing her. No, wouldn't it be better to try Svidrigailov? And he could not help inwardly admitting that he had long felt that he must see him for some reason. But what could they have in common? Their very evil doing could not be of the same kind. The man, moreover, was very unpleasant, evidently depraved, undoubtedly cunning and deceitful, possibly malignant. Such stories were told about him. It's true he was befriending Katerina Ivanovna's children, but who could tell with what motive and what it meant? The man always had some design, some project. There was another thought which had been continually hovering of late about Raskolnikov's mind, and causing him great uneasiness. It was so painful that he made distinct efforts to get rid of it. He sometimes thought that Svidrigailov was dogging his footsteps. Svidrigailov had found out his secret, and had had designs on Dunya. What if he had them still? Wasn't it practically certain that he had? And what if, having learned his secret, and so having gained power over him, he were to use it as a weapon against Dunya? This idea sometimes even tormented his dreams, but it had never presented itself so vividly to him as on his way to Svidrigailov. The very thought moved him to gloomy rage. To begin with, this would transform everything, even his own position. He would have at once to confess his secret to Dunya. Would he have to give himself up, perhaps, to prevent Dunya from taking some rash step? The letter? This morning Dunya had received a letter. From whom could she get letters in Petersburg? Luzhin, perhaps? It's true Razumikhin was there to protect her, but Razumikhin knew nothing of the position. Perhaps it was his duty to tell Razumikhin. He thought of it with repugnance. In any case, he must see Svidrigailov as soon as possible, he decided finally. 
Thank God the details of the interview were of little consequence. If only he could get at the root of the matter, but if Svidrigailov were capable, if he were intriguing against Dunya, then... Raskolnikov was so exhausted by what he had passed through that month that he could only decide such questions in one way. Then I shall kill him, he thought in cold despair. A sudden anguish oppressed his heart. He stood still in the middle of the street and began looking about to see where he was and which way he was going. He found himself in X prospect, thirty or forty paces from the haymarket, through which he had come. The whole second story of the house on the left was used as a tavern. All the windows were wide open. Judging from the figures moving at the windows, the rooms were full to overflowing. There were sounds of singing of clarionet and violin, and the boom of a Turkish drum. He could hear women shrieking. He was about to turn back, wondering why he had come to the ex-prospect, when suddenly, at one of the end windows, he saw Svidrigailov, sitting at a tea-table right in the open window with a pipe in his mouth. Raskolnikov was dreadfully taken aback, almost terrified. Svidrigailov was silently watching and scrutinizing him, and what struck Raskolnikov at once, seemed to be meaning to get up and slip away unobserved. Raskolnikov at once pretended not to have seen him, but to be looking absent-mindedly away while he watched him out of the corner of his eye. His heart was beating violently. Yes, it was evident that Svidrigailov did not want to be seen. He took the pipe out of his mouth, and was on the point of concealing himself but as he got up and moved back his chair, he seemed to have become suddenly aware that Raskolnikov had seen him, and was watching him. What had passed between them was much the same as what happened at their first meeting in Raskolnikov's room. A sly smile came into Svidrigailov's face and grew broader and broader. Each knew that he was seen and watched by the other. At last Svidrigailov broke into a loud laugh. "'Well, well, come in if you want me. I am here,' he shouted from the window. Raskolnikov went up into the tavern. He found Svidrigailov in a tiny back room, adjoining the saloon in which merchants, clerks, and numbers of people of all sorts were drinking tea at twenty little tables to the desperate bawling of a chorus of singers. The click of billiard balls could be heard in the distance. On the table before Svidrigailov stood an open bottle and a glass half full of champagne. In the room he found also a boy with a little hand organ, a healthy-looking red-cheeked girl of eighteen, wearing a tucked-up striped skirt and a Tyrolese hat with ribbons. In spite of the chorus in the other room, she was singing some servants' hall song in a rather husky contralto to the accompaniment of the organ. "'Come, that's enough!' Svidrigailov stopped her at Raskolnikov's entrance. The girl at once broke off and stood waiting respectfully. She had sung her guttural rhymes, too, with a serious and respectful expression in her face. "'Hey, Philip, a glass!' shouted Svidrigailov. "'I won't drink anything,' said Raskolnikov. "'As you like, I didn't mean it for you. Drink, Katya. I don't want anything more today. You can go.' He poured her out a full glass— and laid down a yellow note. Katya drank off her glass of wine, as women do without putting it down in twenty gulps, took the note and kissed Svidrigailov's hand, which he allowed quite seriously. She went out of the room, and the boy trailed after her with the organ. Both had been brought in from the street. Svidrigailov had not been a week in Petersburg, but everything about him was already, so to speak, on a patriarchal footing. The waiter, Philip, was by now an old friend, and very obsequious. The door leading to the saloon had a lock on it. Svidrigailov was at home in this room, and perhaps spent whole days in it. The tavern was dirty and wretched, not even second-rate. "'I was going to see you, and looking for you,' Raskolnikov began, "'but I don't know what made me turn from the haymarket into the ex-prospect just now.' 
I never take this turning. I turn to the right from the haymarket, and this isn't the way to you. I simply turned, and here you are. It is strange. Why don't you say at once it's a miracle? Because it may be only chance. Oh, that's the way with all you folk, laughed Svidrigailov. You won't admit it even if you do inwardly believe it a miracle. Here you say that it may be only chance. And what cowards they all are here about having an opinion of their own. You can't imagine, Rodion Romanovich. I don't mean you. You have an opinion of your own. And are not afraid to have it. That's how it was you attracted my curiosity. Nothing else? Well, that's enough, you know. Svidrigailov was obviously exhilarated, but only slightly so. He had not had more than half a glass of wine. I fancy you came to see me before you knew that I was capable of having what you call an opinion of my own, observed Raskolnikov. Ah, oh, well, it was a different matter. Everyone has his own plans. And apropos of the miracle, let me tell you that I think you have been asleep for the last two or three days. I told you of this tavern myself. There is no miracle in your coming straight here. I explained the way myself told you where it was, and the hours you could find me here. Do you remember? I don't remember, answered Raskolnikov with surprise. I believe you. I told you twice. The address has been stamped mechanically on your memory. You turned this way mechanically, and yet precisely according to the direction, though you are not aware of it. When I told you then, I hardly hoped you understood me. You give yourself away too much, Rodion Romanovich. And another thing. I am convinced that there are lots of people in Petersburg who talk to themselves as they walk. This is a town of crazy people. If only we had scientific men. Doctors, lawyers, and philosophers might make most valuable investigations in Petersburg, each in his own line. There are few places where there are so many gloomy, strong, and queer influences on the soul of man, as in Petersburg. The mere influences of climate mean so much. And it's the administrative center of all Russia, and its character must be reflected on the whole country. But that is neither here nor there. Now, the point is that I have several times watched you. You walk out of your house, holding your head high. Twenty paces from home you let it sink, and fold your hands behind your back. You look and evidently see nothing before nor beside you. At last you begin moving your lips and talking to yourself, and sometimes you wave one hand and declaim, and at last stand still in the middle of the road. That's not at all the thing. Someone may be watching you besides me, and it won't do you any good. It's nothing really to do with me, and I can't cure you, but, of course, you understand me. Did you know that I am being followed? asked Raskolnikov, looking inquisitively at him. No, I know nothing about it, said Svidrigailov, seeming surprised. Well, then, let's leave me alone, Raskolnikov muttered, frowning. Very good, let's leave you alone. You had better tell me... If you come here to drink, and directed me twice to come here to you, why did you hide, and try to get away just now when I looked at the window from the street? I saw it. <laughs> and why was it you lay on your sofa with closed eyes and pretended to be asleep, though you were wide awake while I stood in your doorway? I saw it. I may have had reasons. You know that yourself. And I may have had my reasons, though you don't know them. Raskolnikov dropped his right elbow on the table, leaned his chin in the fingers of his right hand, and stared intently at Svidrigailov. For a full minute he scrutinized his face, which had impressed him before. It was a strange face, like a mask, white and red, with bright red lips, with a flaxen beard, and still thick, 
flaxen hair. His eyes were somehow too blue, and their expression somehow too heavy and fixed. There was something awfully unpleasant in that handsome face, which looked so wonderfully young for his age. Svidrigailov was smartly dressed, in light summer clothes, and was particularly dainty in his linen. He wore a huge ring with a precious stone in it. "'Have I got to bother myself about you, too, now?' said Raskolnikov suddenly, coming with nervous impatience straight to the point. "'Even though perhaps you are the most dangerous man, if you care to injure me, I don't want to put myself out any more. I will show you at once that I don't prize myself as you probably think I do. I've come to tell you at once that if you keep to your former intentions with regard to my sister, and if you think to derive any benefit in that direction from what has been discovered of late, I will kill you before you get me locked up. You can count on my word. You know that I can keep it. And in the second place, if you want to tell me something, for I keep imagining all this time that you have something to tell me, make haste and tell it, for time is precious, and very likely it will soon be too late. Why in such haste? asked Svidrigailov, looking at him curiously. Every one has his plans, Raskolnikov answered gloomily and impatiently. You urged me yourself to frankness just now, and at the first question you refused to answer, Svidrigailov observed with a smile. You keep fancying that I have aims of my own, and so you look at me with suspicion. Of course, it's perfectly natural in your position. But though I should like to be friends with you, I shan't trouble myself to convince you of the contrary. The game isn't worth the candle, and I wasn't intending to talk to you about anything special. What did you want me for, then? It was you who came hanging about me. Why, simply as an interesting subject for observation. I liked the fantastic nature of your position. That's what it was. Besides, you are the brother of a person who greatly interested me. And from that person I had in the past heard a very great deal about you, from which I gathered that you had a great influence over her. Isn't that enough? <laughs> Still, I must admit that your question is rather complex and is difficult for me to answer. Here... You, for instance, have come to me not only for a definite reason, but for the sake of hearing something new. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? persisted Svidrigailov with a sly smile. Well, can't you fancy, then, that I, too, on my way here in the train, was counting on you, on your telling me something new? and on my making some profit out of you? You see what rich men we are. What profit could you make? How can I tell you? How do I know? You see in what a tavern I spend all my time, and it's my enjoyment. That's to say, it's no great enjoyment, but one must sit somewhere. That poor Katya now, you saw her? If only I had been a glutton now, a club gourmand. But you see, I can eat this. He pointed to a little table in the corner where the remnants of a terrible-looking beefsteak and potatoes lay on a tin dish. Have you dined, by the way? I've had something and want nothing more. I don't drink, for instance, at all. Except for champagne, I never touch anything. And not more than a glass of that all the evening. And even that is enough to make my head ache. I ordered it just now to wind myself up. 
for I am just going off somewhere, and you see me in a peculiar state of mind. That was why I hid myself just now, like a schoolboy, for I was afraid you would hinder me. But I believe, he pulled out his watch, I can spend an hour with you. It's half past four now. If only I'd been something, a landowner, a father, a cavalry officer, a photographer, a journalist. I am nothing. No specialty. And sometimes I am positively bored. I really thought you would tell me something new. But what are you? And why have you come here? What am I? You know, a gentleman. I served for two years in the cavalry. Then I knocked about here in Petersburg. Then I married Marfa Petrovna and lived in the country. There. You have my biography. You are a gambler, I believe. No. A poor sort of gambler, a card sharper, not a gambler. You have been a card sharper, then? Yes. I've been a card sharper, too. Didn't you get thrashed sometimes? It did happen. Why? Why, you might have challenged them. Altogether, it must have been lively. I won't contradict you, and besides, I am no hand at philosophy. I confess that I hastened here for the sake of the women. As soon as you buried Marfa Petrovna? Quite so. Svidrigailov smiled with engaging candor. What of it? You seem to find something wrong in my speaking like that about women. You ask whether I find anything wrong in vice? Vice. Oh, that's what you are after. But I'll answer you in order, first about women in general. You know I am fond of talking. Tell me, what should I restrain myself for? Why should I give up women, since I have a passion for them? It's an occupation, anyway. So, you hope for nothing here but vice? Oh, very well, for vice, then. You insist on its being vice. But anyway, I like a direct question. In this vice, at least, there is something permanent, founded indeed upon nature, and not dependent on fantasy. Something present in the blood, like an ever-burning ember, forever setting one on fire, and maybe not to be quickly extinguished, even with years. You'll agree it's an occupation of a sort. That's nothing to rejoice at. It's a disease, and a dangerous one. Oh, that's what you think, is it? I agree that it is a disease like everything that exceeds moderation. And, of course, in this one must exceed moderation. But in the first place, everybody does so in one way or another, and in the second place, of course, one ought to be moderate and prudent, however mean it may be. But what am I to do? If I hadn't this, I might have to shoot myself. I am ready to admit that a decent man ought to put up with being bored, but yet— And could you shoot yourself? Oh, come! Svidrigailov parried with disgust. Please don't speak of it, he added hurriedly, and with none of the bragging tone he had shown in all the previous conversation. His face quite changed. I admit it's an unpardonable weakness, but I can't help it. I am afraid of death, and I dislike its being talked of. Do you know that I am to a certain extent a mystic? Ah, uh, the apparitions of Marfa Petrovna. Do they still go on visiting you? Oh, don't talk of them. There have been no more in Petersburg. Confound them. 
he cried with an air of irritation. Let's rather talk of that, though. Hmm, I have not much time and can't stay long with you. It's a pity. I should have found plenty to tell you. What's your engagement? A woman? Yes, a woman. A casual incident. No, that's not what I want to talk of. And the hideousness? The filthiness of all your surroundings? Doesn't that affect you? Have you lost the strength to stop yourself? And do you pretend to strength, too? <laughs> you surprised me just now, Rodion Romanovich, though I knew beforehand it would be so. You preach to me about vice and aesthetics. You, a Schiller. You, an idealist. Of course, that's all as it should be, and it would be surprising if it were not so. Yet it is strange in reality. Ah, what a pity I have no time, for you are a most interesting type. And by the way, are you fond of Schiller? I am awfully fond of him. But what a braggart you are, Raskolnikov said with some disgust. Upon my word, I am not, answered Svidrigailov, laughing. However, I won't dispute it. Let me be a braggart. Why not brag if it hurts no one? I spent seven years in the country with Marfa Petrovna, so now when I come across an intelligent person like you, intelligent and highly interesting, I am simply glad to talk. And besides, I've drunk that half glass of champagne, and it's gone to my head a little. And besides, there's a certain fact that has wound me up tremendously. But about that I will keep quiet. Where are you off to? he asked in alarm. Raskolnikov had begun getting up. He felt oppressed and stifled, and, as it were, ill at ease at having come here. He felt convinced that Svidrigailov was the most worthless scoundrel on the face of the earth. "'Ah, sit down, stay a little,' Svidrigailov begged. "'Let them bring you some tea anyway. Stay a little. I won't talk nonsense. About myself, I mean. I'll tell you something. If you like, I'll tell you how a woman tried to save me, as you would call it. It will be an answer to your first question, indeed, for the woman was your sister. May I tell you? It will help to spend the time. Tell me. But I trust that you... Oh, don't be uneasy. Besides, even in a worthless, low fellow like me, Avdotya Romanovna can only excite the deepest respect. Chapter 4 You know, perhaps, yes, I told you myself, began Svidrigailov, that I was in the debtor's prison here for an immense sum and had not any expectation of being able to pay it. There's no need to go into particulars of how Marfa Petrovna bought me out. Do you know to what a point of insanity a woman can sometimes love? She was an honest woman, and very sensible, although completely uneducated. Would you believe that this honest and jealous woman, after many scenes of hysterics and reproaches, condescended to enter into a kind of contract with me which she kept throughout our married life? She was considerably older than I, and besides, she always kept a clove or something in her mouth. There was so much swinishness in my soul, and honesty, too, of a sort, as to tell her straight out that I couldn't be absolutely faithful to her. This confession drove her to frenzy, but yet she seems in a way to have liked my brutal frankness. She thought it showed I was unwilling to deceive her if I warned her like this beforehand. And for a jealous woman, you know, that's the first consideration. After many tears, an unwritten contract was drawn up between us, 
First, that I would never leave Martha Petrona, and would always be her husband. Secondly, that I would never absent myself without her permission. Thirdly, that I would never set up a permanent mistress. Fourthly, in return for this, Martha Petrovna gave me a free hand with the maidservants, but only with her secret knowledge. Fifthly, God forbid my falling in love with a woman of our class. Sixthly, in case I, which God forbid, should be visited by a great serious passion, I was bound to reveal it to Martha Petrovna. On this last score, however, Marfa Petrovna was fairly at ease. She was a sensible woman, and so she could not help looking upon me as a dissolute profligate incapable of real love. But a sensible woman and a jealous woman are two very different things, and that's where the trouble came in. But to judge some people impartially, we must renounce certain preconceived opinions and our habitual attitude to the ordinary people about us. I have reason to have faith in your judgment rather than in any one's. Perhaps you have already heard a great deal that was ridiculous and absurd about Marfa Petrovna. She certainly had some very ridiculous ways, but I tell you frankly, that I feel really sorry for the innumerable woes of which I was the cause. Well, and that's enough, I think, by way of a decorous oraison funèbre for the most tender wife of a most tender husband. When we quarrelled, I usually held my tongue and did not irritate her, and that Gentlemanly conduct rarely failed to attain its object. It influenced her. It pleased her, indeed. These were times when she was positively proud of me. But your sister, she couldn't put up with anyway. And however she came to risk taking such a beautiful creature into her house as a governess. My explanation is that Marfa Petrovna was an ardent and impressionable woman, and simply fell in love herself. Literally fell in love with your sister. Well, little wonder. Look at Avdotya Romanovna. I saw the danger at the first glance. And what do you think? I resolved not to look at her even. But Avdotya Romanovna herself made the first step. Would you believe it? Would you believe it, too, that Marfa Petrovna was positively angry with me at first for my persistent silence about your sister? For my careless reception of her continual adoring praises of Avdotya Romanovna? I don't know what it was she wanted. Well, of course, Marfa Petrovna told Avdotya Romanovna every detail about me. She had the unfortunate habit of telling literally everyone all our family secrets, and continually complaining of me. How could she fail to confide in such a delightful new friend? I expect they talked of nothing else but me, and no doubt Avdotya Romanovna heard all those dark, mysterious rumours that were current about me. I don't mind betting that you, too, have heard something of the sort already. I have. Luzhin charged you with having caused the death of a child. Is that true? Don't refer to those vulgar tales, I beg, said Svidrigailov with disgust and annoyance. If you insist on wanting to know about all that idiocy, I will tell you one day. But now... I was told, too, about some footman of yours, 
in the country whom you treated badly. I beg you to drop the subject, Svidrigailov interrupted again with obvious impatience. Was that the footman who came to you after death to fill your pipe? You told me about it yourself. Raskolnikov felt more and more irritated. Svidrigailov looked at him attentively, and Raskolnikov fancied he caught a flash of spiteful mockery in that look. But Svidrigailov restrained himself and answered very civilly. Yes, it was. I see that you, too, are extremely interested and shall feel it my duty to satisfy your curiosity at the first opportunity. Upon my soul. I see that I really might pass for a romantic figure with some people. Judge how grateful I must be to Marfa Petrovna for having repeated to Avdotya Romanovna such mysterious and interesting gossip about me. I dare not guess what impression it made on her. But in any case, it worked in my interests. With all Avdotya Romanovna's natural aversion, and in spite of my invariably gloomy and repellent aspect, she did at least feel pity for me. Pity for a lost soul. And if once a girl's heart is moved to pity, it's more dangerous than anything. She is bound to want to save him, to bring him to his senses, and lift him up and draw him to nobler aims, and restore him to new life and usefulness. Well, we all know how far such dreams can go. I saw at once that the bird was flying into the cage of herself. And I, too, made ready. I think you are frowning, Rodion Romanovich. There's no need, as you know, it all ended in smoke. Hang it all, what a lot I am drinking. Do you know, I always, from the very beginning, regretted that it wasn't your sister's fate to be born in the second or third century A.D., as the daughter of a reigning prince, or some governor, or proconsul in Asia Minor. She would undoubtedly have been one of those who would endure martyrdom and would have smiled when they branded her bosom with hot pincers. And she would have gone to it of herself. And in the fourth or fifth century, she would have walked away into the Egyptian desert and would have stayed there thirty years living on roots and ecstasies and visions. She is simple thirsting to face some torture for someone. And if she can't get her torture, she'll throw herself out of a window. I've heard something of a Mr. Razumichin. He's said to be a sensible fellow. His surname suggests it, indeed. He's probably a divinity student. Well, he'd better look after your sister. I believe I understand her, and I am proud of it. But at the beginning of an acquaintance, as you know, one is apt to be more heedless and stupid. One doesn't see clearly. Hang it all. Why is she so handsome? It's not my fault. In fact, it began on my side with a most irresistible physical desire. Avdotya Romanovna, is awfully chaste. Incredibly and phenomenally so. Take note, I tell you this about your sister as a fact. She is almost morbidly chaste, in spite of her broad intelligence. And it will stand in her way. There happened to be a girl in the house then, Parasha, a black-eyed wench whom I had never seen before. She had just come from another village. Very pretty but incredibly stupid. She burst into tears, wailed so that she could be heard all over the place and caused scandal. One day after dinner, Avdotya Romanovna followed me into an avenue in the garden and with flashing eyes insisted on my leaving poor Parasha alone. 
It was almost our first conversation by ourselves. I, of course, was only too pleased to obey her wishes. Tried to appear disconcerted, embarrassed. In fact, played my part not badly. Then came interviews, mysterious conversations, exhortations, entreaties, supplications, even tears. Would you believe it? Even tears. Think what the passion for propaganda will bring some girls to. I, of course, threw it all on my destiny, posed as hungering and thirsting for light, and finally resorted to the most powerful weapon in the subjection of the female heart, a weapon which never fails one. It's the well-known resource. Flattery. Nothing in the world is harder than speaking the truth, and nothing easier than flattery. If there's the hundredth part of a false note in speaking the truth, it leads to a discord, and that leads to trouble. But if all to the last note is false in flattery, it is just as agreeable, and is heard not without satisfaction. It may be a coarse satisfaction, but still a satisfaction. And however coarse the flattery, at least half will be sure to seem true. That's so for all stages of development and classes of society. A vestal virgin might be seduced by flattery. I can never remember without laughter how I once seduced a lady who was devoted to her husband, her children, and her principles. What fun it was, and how little trouble. And the lady really had principles of her own, anyway. All my tactics lay in simply being utterly annihilated and prostrate before her purity. I flattered her shamelessly, and as soon as I succeeded in getting a pressure of the hand, even a glance from her, I would reproach myself for having snatched it by force, and would declare that she had resisted, so that I could never have gained anything but for my being so unprincipled. I maintained that she was so innocent that she could not foresee my treachery, and yielded to me unconsciously, unawares, and so on. In fact, I triumphed, while my lady remained firmly convinced that she was innocent, chaste, and faithful to all her duties and obligations, and had succumbed quite by accident. And how angry she was with me when I explained to her at last that it was my sincere conviction that she was just as eager as I. Poor Marfa Petrovna was awfully weak on the side of flattery, and if I had only cared to, I might have had all her property settled on me during her lifetime. I am drinking an awful lot of wine now and talking too much. I hope you won't be angry if I mention now that I was beginning to produce the same effect on Avdotya Romanovna. But I was stupid and impatient and spoiled it all. Avdotya Romanovna had several times, and one time in particular, been greatly displeased by the expression of my eyes. Would you believe it? There was sometimes a light in them which frightened her, and grew stronger and stronger and more unguarded till it was hateful to her. No need to go into detail, but we parted. There I acted stupidly again. I fell to jeering in the coarsest way at all such propaganda and efforts to convert me. Parasha came on to the scene again, and not she alone. In fact, there was a tremendous to-do. Ah, Rodion Romanovich, if you could only see how your sister's eyes can flash sometimes. Never mind my being drunk at this moment, and having had a whole glass of wine, I am speaking the truth. I assure you that this glance has haunted my dreams. The very rustle of her dress was more than I could stand at last. 
I really began to think that I might become epileptic. I could never have believed that I could be moved to such a frenzy. It was essential, indeed, to be reconciled, but by then it was impossible. And imagine what I did then. To what a pitch of stupidity a man can be brought by frenzy. Never undertake anything in a frenzy, Rodion Romanovich. I reflected that Avdotya Romanovna was, after all, a beggar. Ugh, excuse me, that's not the word. But does it matter if it expresses the meaning? That she lived by her work. That she had her mother and you to keep. Ugh, hang it, you are frowning again. And I resolved to offer her all my money, thirty thousand roubles I could have realized then, if she would run away with me here to Petersburg. Of course I should have vowed eternal love, rapture, and so on. Do you know, I was so wild about her at that time that if she had told me to poison Marfa Petrovna or to cut her throat and to marry herself, it would have been done at once. But it ended in the catastrophe of which you know already. You can fancy how frantic I was when I heard that Marfa Petrovna had got hold of that scoundrelly attorney, Luzhin, and had almost made a match between them which would really have been just the same thing as I was proposing. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I notice that you've begun to be very attentive. You interesting young man. Svidrigailov struck the table with his fist, impatiently. He was flushed. Raskolnikov saw clearly that the glass or a glass and a half of champagne that he had sipped almost unconsciously was affecting him, and he resolved to take advantage of the opportunity. He felt very suspicious of Svidrigailov. Well, after what you have said, I am fully convinced that you have come to Petersburg with designs on my sister, he said directly to Svidrigailov, in order to irritate him further. Oh, nonsense! said Svidrigailov, seeming to rouse himself. Why, I told you. Besides, your sister can't endure me. Yes, I am certain that she can't. But that's not the point. Are you so sure that she can't? Svidrigailov screwed up his eyes and smiled mockingly. You are right. She doesn't love me, but you can never be sure of what has passed between husband and wife, or lover and mistress. There's always a little corner which remains a secret to the world, and is only known to those two. Will you answer for it, that Avdotya Romanovna regarded me with aversion? From some words you've dropped. I notice that you still have designs, and of course evil ones, on Dunya, and mean to carry them out promptly. What? Have I dropped words like that? Svidrigailov asked in naive dismay, taking not the slightest notice of the epithet bestowed on his designs. Why, you are dropping them even now. Why are you so frightened? What are you so afraid of now? Me? Afraid? Afraid of you? You have rather to be afraid of me, cher ami. But what nonsense. I've drunk too much, though I see that I was almost saying too much again. Damn the wine. Hey, there, water. He snatched up the champagne bottle and flung it without ceremony out of the window. Philip brought the water. "'That's all nonsense,' said Svidrigailov, wetting a towel and putting it to his head. "'But I can answer you in one word, and annihilate all your suspicions. "'Do you know that I am going to get married?' "'You told me so before.' "'Did I? I've forgotten.' But I couldn't have told you so for certain, for I had not even seen my betrothed. I only meant to. But now I really have a betrothed, and it's a settled thing. 
and if it weren't that I have business that can't be put off, I would have taken you to see them at once, for I should like to ask your advice. Ugh, hang it, only ten minutes left. See, so look at the watch. This ends Disc 18. Crime and Punishment, Disc 19. But I must tell you, for it's an interesting story, my marriage, in its own way. Where are you off to? Going again? No. I'm not going away now. Not at all. We shall see. I'll take you there. I'll show you my betrothed. Only not now. For you'll soon have to be off. You have to go to the right and I to the left. Do you know that Madame Reslich, the woman I am lodging with now, eh? I know what you're thinking, that she's the woman whose girl they say drowned herself in the winter. Come, are you listening? She arranged it all for me. You're bored, she said. You want something to fill up your time. For you know I am a gloomy, depressed person. Do you think I'm light-hearted? No, I'm gloomy. I do no harm, but sit in a corner without speaking a word for three days at a time. And that Reslich is a sly hussy, I tell you. I know what she has got in her mind. She thinks I shall get sick of it. Abandon my wife and depart, and she'll get hold of her and make a profit out of her, in our class, of course, or higher. She told me the father was a broken-down, retired official, who has been sitting in a chair for the last three years with his legs paralyzed. The mamma, she said, was a sensible woman. There is a son serving in the provinces, but he doesn't help. There is a daughter who is married, but she doesn't visit them. And they've two little nephews on their hands, as though their own children were not enough. And they've taken from school their youngest daughter, a girl who'll be sixteen in another month, so that then she can be married. She was for me. We went there. How funny it was. I present myself, a landowner, a widower, of a well-known name, with connections, with a fortune. What if I am fifty and she is not sixteen? Who thinks of that? But it's fascinating, isn't it? It is fascinating. <laughs> you should have seen how I talked to the papa and mamma. It was worth paying to have seen me at that moment. She comes in, curtsies, you can fancy, still in a short frock, an unopened bud, flushing like a sunset. She had been told, no doubt. I don't know how you feel about female faces, but to my mind, these sixteen years, these childish eyes, shyness, and tears of bashfulness, are better than beauty. And she is a perfect little picture, too. Fair hair and little curls, like a lamb's, full little rosy lips, tiny feet. A charmer. Well, we made friends. I told them I was in a hurry, owing to domestic circumstances, and the next day, that is the day before yesterday, we were betrothed. When I go now, I take her on my knee at once, and keep her there. Well, she flushes like a sunset, and I kiss her every minute. Her mamma, of course, impresses on her that this is her husband and that this must be so. It's simply delicious. The present betrothed condition is perhaps better than marriage. Here you have what is called la nature et la vérité. <laughs> I've talked to her twice. She is far from a fool. Sometimes she steals a look at me that positively scorches me. Her face is like Raphael's Madonna. You know, the Sistine Madonna's face has something fantastic in it. The face of mournful religious ecstasy. Haven't you noticed it? Well, she's something in that line. The day after we'd been betrothed, I bought her presents to the value of fifteen hundred roubles, a set of diamonds, and another of pearls, and a silver dressing-case as large as this, with all sorts of things in it, so that even my Madonna's face glowed. 
I sat her on my knee yesterday, and I suppose rather too unceremoniously. She flushed crimson, and the tears started, but she didn't want to show it. We were left alone. She suddenly flung herself on my neck, for the first time of her own accord, put her little arms round me, kissed me, and vowed that she would be an obedient, faithful, and good wife, would make me happy, would devote all her life, every minute of her life, would sacrifice everything, everything, and that all she asks in return is my respect and that she wants nothing, nothing more from me, no presents. You'll admit that to hear such a confession, alone, from an angel of sixteen, in a muslin frock with little curls, with a flush of maiden shyness in her cheeks, and tears of enthusiasm in her eyes, is rather fascinating. Isn't it fascinating? It's worth paying for, isn't it? Well, listen. We'll go to see my betrothed, only not just now. The fact is this monstrous difference in age and development excites your sensuality. Will you really make such a marriage? Why, of course. Everyone thinks of himself, and he lives most gaily who knows best how to deceive himself. <laughs> but why are you so keen about virtue? Have mercy on me, my good friend. I am a sinful man. <laughs> but you have provided for the children of Katerina Ivanovna, though, though you had your own reasons. I understand it all now. I am always fond of children, very fond of them, laughed Svidrigailov. I can tell you one curious instance of it. The first day I came here I visited various haunts. After seven years I simply rushed at them. You probably notice that I am not in a hurry to renew acquaintance with my old friends. I shall do without them as long as I can. Do you know, when I was with Marfa Petrovna in the country, I was haunted by the thought of these places where anyone who knows his way about can find a great deal. Yes, upon my soul. The peasants have vodka. The educated young people, shut out from activity, waste themselves in impossible dreams and visions and are crippled by theories. Jews have sprung up and are amassing money. And all the rest give themselves up to debauchery. From the first hour the town reeked of its familiar odours. I chanced to be in a frightful den. I like my dens dirty. It was a dance, so called. And there was a can can such as I never saw in my day. Yes, there you have progress. All of a sudden I saw a little girl of thirteen, nicely dressed, dancing with a specialist in that line, with another one vis a vis. Her mother was sitting on a chair by the wall. You can't imagine what a can can that was. The girl was ashamed blushed, at last felt insulted and began to cry. Her partner seized her and began whirling her round and performing before her. Everyone laughed, and I like your public, even the can-can public. They laughed and shouted, serves her right, serves her right, shouldn't bring children. Well, it's not my business whether that consoling reflection was logical or not. I at once fixed on my plan, sat down by the mother, and began by saying that I, too, was a stranger, and that people here were ill-bred, and that they couldn't distinguish decent folks and treat them with respect, gave her to understand that I had plenty of money, offered to take them home in my carriage. I took them home, and got to know them. They were lodging in a miserable little hole, and had only just arrived from the country. She told me that she and her daughter could only regard my acquaintance as an honour. I found out that they had nothing of their own, and had come to town upon some legal business. I proffered my services and money. I learnt that they had gone to the dancing saloon by mistake, believing that it was a genuine 
dancing class. I offered to assist in the young girl's education, in French, and dancing. My offer was accepted with enthusiasm, as an honor, and we are still friendly. If you like, we'll go and see them, only not just now. Stop! Enough of your vile, nasty anecdotes, depraved, vile, sensual man! Schiller, you are a regular Schiller! Oh, la vertu va-t-elle se nicher? But you know I shall tell you these things on purpose, for the pleasure of hearing your outcries. I dare say. I can see I am ridiculous myself, muttered Raskolnikov angrily. Svidrigailov laughed heartily. Finally he called Philip, paid his bill, and began getting up. "'I say, but I am drunk, I say, Cosé,' he said. "'It's been a pleasure.' "'I should rather think it must be a pleasure,' cried Raskolnikov, getting up. "'No doubt it is a pleasure for a worn-out profligate to describe such adventures with a monstrous project of the same sort in his mind.' especially under such circumstances, and to such a man as me. It's stimulating. Well, if you come to that, Svidrigailov answered, scrutinizing Raskolnikov with some surprise. If you come to that, you are a thorough cynic yourself. You've plenty to make you so, anyway. You can understand a great deal. And you can do a great deal, too. But enough. I sincerely regret not having had more talk with you, but I shan't lose sight of you. Only wait a bit. Svidrigailov walked out of the restaurant. Arskonikov walked out after him. Svidrigailov was not, however, very drunk. The wine had affected him for a moment, but it was passing off every minute. He was preoccupied with something of importance and was frowning. He was apparently excited and uneasy in anticipation of something. His manner to Raskolnikov had changed during the last few minutes, and he was ruder and more sneering every moment. Raskolnikov noticed all this, and he too was uneasy. He became very suspicious of Svidrigailov, and resolved to follow him. They came out onto the pavement. "'You go to the right, and I to the left, or, if you like, the other way.' Only, adieu, mon plaisir. May we meet again. And he walked to the right, towards the Haymarket. Chapter 5 Raskolnikov walked after him. What's this? cried Svidrigailov, turning round. I thought I said... It means that I am not going to lose sight of you now. What? Both stood still and gazed at one another, as though measuring their strength. From all your half-tipsy stories, Raskolnikov observed harshly, I am positive that you have not given up your designs on my sister, but are pursuing them more actively than ever. I have learned that my sister received a letter this morning. You have hardly been able to sit still all this time. "'You may have unearthed a wife on the way, but that means nothing. "'I should like to make certain myself.' "'Raskolnikov could hardly have said himself what he wanted, "'and of what he wished to make certain. "'Upon my word, I'll call the police. Call away.' "'Again they stood for a minute, facing each other. "'At last Svidrigailov's face changed.' Having satisfied himself that Raskolnikov was not frightened at his threat, he assumed a mirthful and friendly air. What a fellow! I purposely refrained from referring to your affair, though I am devoured by curiosity. It's a fantastic affair. I've put it off till another time, but you're enough to rouse the dead. Well, let us go, only I warn you beforehand. I am only going home for a moment, to get some money. Then I shall lock up the flat, take a cab, and go to spend the evening at the islands. Now, now are you going to follow me? I am coming to your lodgings not to see you, but Sofia Semyonovna, to say I am sorry not to have been at the funeral. 
That's as you like, but Sofia Semyonovna is not at home. She has taken the three children to an old lady of high rank, the patroness of some orphan asylums, whom I used to know years ago. I charmed the old lady by depositing a sum of money with her to provide for the three children of Katerina Ivanovna, and subscribing to the institution as well. I told her, too, the story of Sofia Semyonovna in full detail, suppressing nothing. It produced an indescribable effect on her. That's why Sofia Semyonovna has been invited to call today at the X hotel where the lady is staying for the time. No matter, I'll come all the same. As you like, it's nothing to me. But I won't come with you. Here we are at home. By the way, I am convinced that you regard me with suspicion just because I have shown such delicacy and have not so far troubled you with questions, you understand. It struck you as extraordinary. I don't mind betting it's that, well, it teaches one to show delicacy. And to listen at doors. Ah, that's it, is it? laughed Svidrigailov. Yes, I should have been surprised if you had let that pass after all that has happened, <laughs> though I did understand something of the pranks you had been up to, and were telling Sofia Semyonovna about what was the meaning of it. Perhaps I am quite behind the times and can't understand. For goodness sake, explain it, my dear boy. Expound the latest theories. You couldn't have earned anything. You're making it all up. But I'm not talking about that, though I did hear something. No, I'm talking of the way you keep sighing and groaning now. The Schiller in you is in revolt every moment. And now you tell me not to listen at doors. If that's how you feel, go and inform the police that you had this mischance. You made a little mistake in your theory. But if you are convinced that one mustn't listen at doors, but one may murder old women at one's pleasure, you'd better be off to America and make haste. Run, young man. There may still be time. I'm speaking sincerely. Haven't you the money? I'll give you the fare. I'm not thinking of that at all, Raskolnikov interrupted with disgust. I understand. But don't put yourself out. Don't discuss it if you don't want to. I understand the questions you are worrying over. Moral ones, aren't they? Duties of citizen and man. Lay them all aside. They are nothing to you now. <laughs> You'll say you are still a man and a citizen. If so, you ought not to have got into this coil. It's no use taking up a job you are not fit for. Well, you'd better shoot yourself. Or don't you want to? You seem trying to enrage me. To make me leave you. What a queer fellow. But here we are. Welcome to the staircase. You see, that's the way to Sofia Semyonovna. Look, there is no one at home. Don't you believe me? Ask Kapir Naumov. She leaves the key with him. Here is Madame du Capernaumov herself. Hey, what? She is rather deaf. Has she gone out? Where? Did you hear? She is not in and won't be till late in the evening, probably. Well, come to my room. You wanted to come and see me, didn't you? Here we are. Madame Resvich is not at home. She is a woman who is always busy. An excellent woman, I assure you. She might have been of use to you if you had been a little more sensible. Now, see, I take this five percent bond out of the bureau. See what a lot I've got of them, still. This one will be turned into cash today. I mustn't waste any more time. The bureau is locked, the flat is locked, and here we are again on the stairs. Shall we take a cab? I'm going to the islands. Would you like a lift? I'll take this carriage. Ah, you refuse. You are tired of it. Come for a drive. I believe it will come on to rain. Never mind. We'll put down the hood. Svidrigailov was already in the carriage. Raskolnikov decided that his suspicions were at least for that moment unjust. Without answering a word, he turned and walked back towards the haymarket. If he had only turned round on his way, he might have seen Svidrigailov get out not a hundred paces off 
dismiss the cab, and walk along the pavement. But he had turned the corner and could see nothing. Intense disgust drew him away from Svidrigailov. To think that I could for one instant have looked for help from that coarse brute, that depraved sensualist and blackguard, he cried. Raskolnikov's judgment was uttered too lightly and hastily. There was something about Svidrigailov which gave him a certain original, even a mysterious character. As concerned his sister, Raskolnikov was convinced that Svidrigailov would not leave her in peace. But it was too tiresome and unbearable to go on thinking and thinking about this. When he was alone, he had not gone twenty paces before he sank, as usual, into deep thought. On the bridge he stood by the railing and began gazing at the water, and his sister was standing close by him. He met her at the entrance to the bridge, but passed by without seeing her. Dunya had never met him like this in the street before, and was struck with dismay. She stood still, and didn't know whether to call to him or not. Suddenly she saw Svidrigailov coming directly from the direction of the haymarket. He seemed to be approaching cautiously. He didn't go on to the bridge, but stood aside on the pavement, doing all he could to avoid Raskolnikov's seeing him. He had observed Dunya for some time, and had been making signs to her. She thought he was signalling to beg her not to speak to her brother, but to come to him. That was what Dunya did. She stole by her brother, and went up to Svidrigailov. "'Let us make haste away.' Svidrigailov whispered to her, "'I don't want Rodion Romanovich to know of our meeting. "'I must tell you, I've been sitting with him in the restaurant close by, "'where he looked me up, and I had great difficulty in getting rid of him. "'He has somehow heard of my letter to you, and suspects something. "'It wasn't you who told him, of course. "'But if not you, who then?' "'Well, we've turned the corner now,' Dunya interrupted. "'And my brother won't see us.' "'I have to tell you that I am going no further with you. "'Speak to me here. "'You can tell it all in the street.' "'In the first place, I can't say it in the street. "'Secondly, you must hear Sofia Semyonovna too. "'And thirdly, I will show you some papers. "'Oh, well, if you won't agree to come with me, "'I shall refuse to give any explanation and go away at once. "'But I beg you not to forget.' that a very curious secret of your beloved brother's is entirely in my keeping. Dunya stood still, hesitating, and looked at Svidrigailov with searching eyes. What are you afraid of? he observed quietly. The town is not the country, and even in the country you did me more harm than I did you. Have you prepared Sofia Semyonovna? No. I have not said a word to her, and am not quite certain whether she is at home now. But most likely she is. She has buried her stepmother today. She is not likely to go visiting on such a day. For the time, I don't want to speak to anyone about it. And I half regret having spoken to you. The slightest indiscretion is as bad as betrayal in a thing like this. I live there in that house we are coming to it. That's the porter of our house. He knows me very well. You see, he's bowing. He sees I'm coming with a lady, and no doubt he has noticed your face already, and you will be glad of that if you are afraid of me and suspicious. Excuse my putting things so coarsely. I haven't a flat to myself. Sofia Semyonovna's room is next to mine. She lodges in the next flat. The whole floor is let out in lodgings. Why are you frightened like a child? Am I really so terrible? Svidrigailov's lips were twisted in a condescending smile. But he was in no smiling mood. His heart was throbbing, and he could scarcely breathe. He spoke rather loud to cover his growing excitement. 
But Dunya did not notice this peculiar excitement. She was so irritated by his remark that she was frightened of him like a child and that he was so terrible to her. Though I know that you are not a man of honor, I am not in the least afraid of you. Lead the way, she said with apparent composure, but her face was very pale. Svidrigailov stopped at Sonya's room. Allow me to inquire whether she is at home. She is not. How unfortunate. But I know she may come quite soon. If she's gone out, it can only be to see a lady about the orphans. Their mother is dead. I've been meddling and making arrangements for them. If Sofia Semyonovna does not come back in ten minutes, I will send her to you today, if you like. This is my flat. These are my two rooms. Madame Reschlich, my landlady, has the next room. Now, look this way. I will show you my chief piece of evidence. This door from my bedroom leads into two perfectly empty rooms which are to let. Here they are. You must look into them with some attention. Svidrigailov occupied two fairly large furnished rooms. Dunya was looking about her mistrustfully, but saw nothing special in the furniture or position of the rooms. Yet there was something to observe, for instance, that Svidrigailov's flat was exactly between two sets of almost uninhabited apartments. His rooms were not entered directly from the passage, but through the landlady's two almost empty rooms. Unlocking a door leading out of his bedroom, Svidrigailov showed Dunya the two empty rooms that were to let. Dunya stopped in the doorway, not knowing what she was called to look upon. But Svidrigailov hastened to explain. Look here, at this second large room. Notice that door, it's locked. By the door stands a chair, the only one in the two rooms. I brought it from my rooms so as to listen more conveniently. Just the other side of the door is Sofia Semyonovna's table. She sat there talking to Rodion Romanovich. And I sat here listening on two successive evenings, for two hours each time. And of course I was able to learn something. What do you think? You listened? Yes, I did. Now, come back to my room. We can't sit down here. He brought Avdotya Romanovna back into his sitting room and offered her a chair. He sat down at the opposite side of the table, at least seven feet from her. But probably there was the same glow in his eyes which had once frightened Dunya so much. She shuddered and once more looked about her distrustfully. It was an involuntary gesture. She evidently did not wish to betray her uneasiness. But the secluded position of Svidrigailov's lodging had suddenly struck her. She wanted to ask whether his landlady at least were at home, but pride kept her from asking. Moreover, she had another trouble in her heart, incomparably greater than fear for herself. She was in great distress. Here is your letter, she said, laying it on the table. Can it be true what you write? You hint at a crime committed, you say, by my brother. You hint at it too clearly. You daren't deny it now. I must tell you that I'd heard of this stupid story before you wrote, and don't believe a word of it. It's a disgusting and ridiculous suspicion. I know the story and why and how it was invented. You can have no proofs. You promised to prove it. Speak. But let me warn you that I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Dunya said this, speaking hurriedly, and for an instant the color rushed to her face. If you didn't believe it, how could you risk coming alone to my rooms? Why have you come? 
simply from curiosity. Don't torment me. Speak. Speak. There's no denying that you are a brave girl. Upon my word, I thought you would have asked Mr. Razumikhin to escort you here. But he was not with you, nor anywhere near. I was on the lookout. It's spirited of you. It proves you wanted to spare Rodion Romanovich. But everything is divine in you. About your brother. What am I to say to you? You've just seen him yourself. What did you think of him? Surely that's not the only thing you are building on. No, not on that, but on his own words. He came here on two successive evenings to see Sofia Semyonovna. I've shown you where they sat. He made a full confession to her. He is a murderer. He killed an old woman, a pawnbroker, with whom he had pawned things himself. He killed her sister, too, a peddler woman called Lizaveta, who happened to come in while he was murdering her sister. He killed them with an axe he brought with him. He murdered them to rob them, and he did rob them. He took money and various things. He told all this, word for word, to Sofia Semyonovna, the only person who knows his secret. But she has had no share by word or deed in the murder. She was as horrified at it as you are now. Don't be anxious. She won't betray him. It cannot be, muttered Dunya with white lips. She gasped for breath. It cannot be. There was not the slightest cause, no sort of ground. It's a lie, a lie. He robbed her. That was the cause. He took money and things. It's true that by his own admission he made no use of the money or things, but hid them under a stone, where they are now. But that was because he dared not make use of them. But how could he steal? Rob, how could he dream of it? cried Dunya, and she jumped up from the chair. Why, you know him, and you've seen him. Can he be a thief? She seemed to be imploring Svidrigailov. She had entirely forgotten her fear. There are thousands and millions of combinations and possibilities of Dotya Romanovna. A thief steals and knows he is a scoundrel. But I've heard of a gentleman who broke open the mail. Who knows, very likely he thought he was doing a gentlemanly thing. Of course, I should not have believed it myself if I'd been told of it as you have, but I believe my own ears. He explained all the causes of it to Sofia Semyonovna, too. But she didn't believe her ears at first, yet she believed her own eyes at last. What? Were the causes. It's a long story of Dotya Romanovna. He is, how shall I tell you, a theory of a sort, the same one by which I, for instance, consider that a single misdeed is permissible if the principal aim is right. A solitary wrongdoing and hundreds of good deeds. It's galling, too, of course, for a young man of gifts and overweening pride to know that if he had, for instance, a paltry three thousand, his whole career, his whole future, would be differently shaped. And yet not to have that three thousand. Add to that nervous irritability from hunger, from lodging in a hole, from rags, from a vivid sense of the charm of his social position and his sister's and mother's position, too. Above all, vanity. Pride and vanity. Though goodness knows he may have good qualities, too. I am not blaming him. Please don't think it. Besides, it's not my business. A special little theory came in, too. A theory of a sort. Dividing mankind, you see, into material and superior persons. That is, 
persons to whom the law does not apply, owing to their superiority, who make laws for the rest of mankind, the material, that is. It's all right as a theory. Une théorie comme une autre. Napoleon attracted him tremendously, that is, what affected him was that a great many men of genius have not hesitated at wrongdoing, but have overstepped the law without thinking about it. He seems to have thought that he was a genius, too. That is, he was convinced of it for a time. He has suffered a great deal, and is still suffering from the idea that he could make a theory but was incapable of boldly overstepping the law. And so he is not a man of genius. And that's humiliating for a young man of any pride, in our day especially. But remorse? You deny him any moral feeling, then? Is he like that? Ah, Avdotya Romanovna, everything is in a muddle now. Not that it was ever in very good order. Russians in general are broad in their ideas, Avdotya Romanovna, broad like their land, and exceedingly disposed to the fantastic, the chaotic. But it's a misfortune to be broad without a special genius. Do you remember what a lot of talk we had together on this subject, sitting in the evenings on the terrace after supper? Why, you used to reproach me with breadth. Who knows, perhaps we were talking at the very time when he was lying here thinking over his plan. There are no sacred traditions amongst us especially in the educated class of Dotya Romanovna. At the best, someone will make them up somehow for himself out of books or from some old chronicle. But those are for the most part the learned and all old fogies, so that it would be almost ill-bred in a man of society. You know my opinions in general, though. I never blame anyone. I do nothing at all. I persevere in that. But we've talked of this more than once before. I was so happy, indeed, as to interest you in my opinions. You are very pale, Avdotya Romanovna. I know his theory. I read that article of his about men to whom all is permitted. Razumikhin brought it to me. Mr. Razumikhin? Your brother's article in a magazine? Is there such an article? I didn't know. It must be interesting. But where are you going, Avdotya Romanovna? I want to see Sofia Semyonovna, Dunya articulated faintly. How do I go to her? She has come in, perhaps. I must see her at once. Perhaps she... Avdotya Romanovna could not finish. Her breath literally failed her. Sofia Semyonovna will not be back till night. At least I believe not. She was to have been back at once, but if not, then she will not be in till quite late. Ah, then you are lying. I see. You were lying, lying all the time. I don't believe you. I don't believe you, cried Dunya, completely losing her head. Almost fainting, she sank onto a chair which Svidrigailov made haste to give her. Of Dr. Romanovna, what is it? Control yourself. Here is some water. Drink a little. He sprinkled some water over her. Dunya shuddered and came to herself. It's had quite an effect, Svidrigailov muttered to himself, frowning. Of Dr. Romanovna, calm yourself. Believe me, he has friends. We will save him. Would you like me to take him abroad? I have money. I can get a ticket in three days. And as for the murder, he will do all sorts of good deeds yet, to atone for it. Calm yourself. He may become a great man yet. Well, how are you? How do you feel? Cruel man. To be able to jeer at it. Let me go. Where are you going? To him. Where is he? Do you know? Why is this door locked? We came in at that door, and now it is locked. When did you manage to lock it? We couldn't be shouting all over the flat on such a subject. I am far from jeering. It's simply that I'm sick of talking like this. 
But how can you go in such a state? Do you want to betray him? You will drive him to fury, and he will give himself up. Let me tell you, he is already being watched. They are already on his track. You will simply be giving him away. Wait a little. I saw him, and was talking to him just now. He can still be saved. Wait a bit, sit down. Let us think it over together. I asked you to come in order to discuss it alone with you, and to consider it thoroughly. But do sit down. How can you save him? Can he really be saved? Dunya sat down. Svidrigailov sat down beside her. It all depends on you. On you. On you alone. He began with glowing eyes, almost in a whisper, and hardly able to utter the words for emotion. Dunya drew back from him in alarm. He too was trembling all over. You. One word from you. And he is saved. I. I'll save him. I have money and friends. I'll send him away at once. I'll get a passport. Two passports. One for him and one for me. I have friends. Capable people. If you like, I'll take a passport for you. For your mother. What do you want with Razumikhin? I love you too. I love you beyond everything. Let me kiss the hem of your dress. Let me, let me. The very rustle of it is too much for me. Tell me, do that and I'll do it. I'll do everything. I will do the impossible. What you believe, I will believe. I'll do anything, anything. Don't, don't look at me like that. Do you know that you are killing me? He was almost beginning to rave. Something seemed suddenly to go to his head. Dunya jumped up and rushed to the door. Open it! Open it! she called, shaking the door. Open it! Is there no one there? Svidrigailov got up and came to himself. His still trembling lips slowly broke into an angry, mocking smile. There is no one at home, he said quietly and emphatically. The landlady has gone out, and it's waste of time to shout like that. You are only exciting yourself uselessly. Where's the key? Open the door at once, at once, base man. I have lost the key, and cannot find it. This is an outrage, cried Dunya, turning pale as death. She rushed to the furthest corner, where she made haste to barricade herself with a little table. She did not scream, but she fixed her eyes on her tormentor and watched every movement he made. Svidrigailov remained standing at the other end of the room, facing her. He was positively composed, at least in appearance, but his face was pale as before. The mocking smile did not leave his face. You spoke of outrage just now, Avdotya Romanovna. In that case you may be sure I have taken measures. Sofia Semyonovna is not at home. The Kapirnaumovs are far away. There are five locked rooms between. I am at least twice as strong as you are. And I have nothing to fear besides. For you could not complain afterwards. You surely would not be willing, actually, to betray your brother. Besides, no one would believe you. How should a girl have come alone to visit a solitary man in his lodgings? So that even if you do sacrifice your brother, you could prove nothing. It is very difficult to prove an assault. Avdotya Romanovna. Scoundrel, whispered Dunya indignantly, as you like. But observe, I was only speaking by way of a general proposition. It's my personal conviction that you are perfectly right. Violence is hateful. I only spoke to show you that you need have no remorse, even if... 
You were willing to save your brother of your own accord, as I suggest to you. You would be simply submitting to circumstances, to violence, in fact, if we must use that word. Think about it. Your brother's and your mother's fate are in your hands. I will be your slave all my life. I will wait here. Sidrigailov sat down on the sofa, about eight steps from Dunya. She had not the slightest doubt now of his unbending determination. Besides, she knew him. Suddenly, she pulled out of her pocket a revolver, cocked it, and laid it in her hand on the table. Svidrigailov jumped up. Aha! Uh -huh. So that's it, is it? he cried, surprised but smiling maliciously. Well, that completely alters the aspect of affairs. You've made things wonderfully easier for me, Avdotya Romanovna. But where did you get the revolver? Was it Mr. Razumihin? Why, it's my revolver, an old friend, and how I've hunted for it. The shooting lessons I've given you in the country have not been thrown away. It's not your revolver. It belonged to Marfa Petrovna, whom you killed. Wretch! There was nothing of yours in her house. I took it when I began to suspect what you were capable of. If you dare to advance one step, I swear I'll kill you. She was frantic. But your brother? I ask from curiosity, said Svidrigailov, still standing where he was. Inform if you want to. Don't stir. Don't come nearer. I'll shoot. You poisoned your wife, I know. You are a murderer yourself. She held the revolver ready. Are you so positive I poisoned Marfa Petrovna? You did. You hinted it yourself. You talked to me of poison. I know you went to get it. You had it in readiness. It was your doing. It must have been your doing. Scoundrel. Even if that were true, it would have been for your sake. You would have been the cause. You are lying. I hated you always, always. Oh, Avdotya Romanovna. You seem to have forgotten how you softened to me in the heat of propaganda. I saw it in your eyes. Do you remember that moonlit night, when the nightingale was singing? That's a lie. There was a flash of fury in Dunya's eyes. That's a lie, and a liable. A lie. Well, if you like, it's a lie. I made it up. Women ought not to be reminded of such things. He smiled. I know you will shoot, you pretty wild creature. Well, shoot away. Dunya raised the revolver, and deadly pale gazed at him, measuring the distance and awaiting the first movement on his part. Her lower lip was white and quivering, and her big black eyes flashed like fire. He had never seen her so handsome. The fire glowing in her eyes at the moment she raised the revolver seemed to kindle him, and there was a pang of anguish in his heart. He took a step forward, and a shot rang out. The bullet grazed his hair and flew into the wall behind. He stood still and laughed softly. The wasp has stung me. She aimed straight at my head. What's this? Blood? He pulled out his handkerchief to wipe the blood, which flowed in a thin stream down his right temple. The bullet seemed to have just grazed the skin. Dunya lowered the revolver and looked at Svidrigailov not so much in terror as in a sort of wild amazement. She seemed not to understand what she was doing and what was going on. 
Well, you missed. Fire again. I'll wait, said Svidrigailov softly, still smiling but gloomily. If you go on like that, I shall have time to seize you before you cock again. Dunya started, quickly cocked the pistol and again raised it. Let me be, she cried in despair. I swear I'll shoot again. I, I'll kill you. Well, at three paces you can hardly help it. But if you don't, then... His eyes flashed, and he took two steps forward. Dunya shot again. It missed fire. You haven't loaded it properly. Never mind, you have another charge there. Get it ready. I'll wait. He stood facing her, two paces away, waiting and gazing at her with wild determination, with feverishly passionate, stubborn, set eyes. Dunya saw that he would sooner die than let her go. And now, of course, she would kill him at two paces. Suddenly she flung away the revolver. She's dropped it, said Svidrigailov with surprise, and he drew a deep breath. A weight seemed to have rolled from his heart, perhaps not only the fear of death. Indeed, he may scarcely have felt it at that moment. It was the deliverance from another feeling, darker and more bitter, which he could not himself have defined. He went to Dunya and gently put his arm round her waist. She did not resist, but, trembling like a leaf, looked at him with suppliant eyes. He tried to say something, but his lips moved without being able to utter a sound. Let me go, Dunya implored. Sidrigailov shuddered. Her voice now was quite different. Then you don't love me? he asked softly. Dunya shook her head. And... And you can't? Never? He whispered in despair. Never. There followed a moment of terrible, dumb struggle in the heart of Svidrigailov. He looked at her with an indescribable gaze. Suddenly, he withdrew his arm, turned quickly to the window, and stood facing it. Another moment passed. Here's the key. He took it out of the left pocket of his coat and laid it on the table behind him without turning or looking at Dunya. Take it. Make haste. He looked stubbornly out of the window. Dunya went up to the table to take the key. Make haste! Make haste! repeated Svidrigailov, still without turning or moving. But there seemed a terrible significance in the tone of that make haste. Dunya understood it, snatched up the key, flew to the door, unlocked it quickly and rushed out of the room. A minute later, beside herself, she ran out onto the canal bank in the direction of the X bridge. Svidrigailov remained three minutes standing at the window. At last he slowly turned, looked about him, and passed his hand over his forehead. A strange smile contorted his face. A pitiful, sad, weak smile, a smile of despair. The blood, which was already getting dry, smeared his hand. He looked angrily at it, then wetted a towel and washed his temple. The revolver which Dunya had flung away lay near the door and suddenly caught his eye. He picked it up and examined it. It was a little pocket three-barrel revolver of old-fashioned construction. 
There were still two charges and one capsule left in it. It could be fired again. He thought a little, put the revolver in his pocket, took his hat, and went out. Chapter 6 He spent that evening, till ten o'clock, going from one low haunt to another. Katya, too, turned up and sang another gutter song, how a certain villain and tyrant began kissing Katya. Sidrigailov treated Katya and the organ grinder and some singers and the waiters and two little clerks. He was particularly drawn to these clerks by the fact that they both had crooked noses, one bent to the left and the other to the right. They took him finally to a pleasure garden where he paid for their entrance. There was one lanky three-year-old pine tree and three bushes in the garden, besides a vox hall, which was in reality a drinking bar where tea, too, was served, and there were a few green tables and chairs standing round it. A chorus of wretched singers and a drunken but exceedingly depressed German clown from Munich with a red nose entertained the public. The clerks quarrelled with some other clerks, and a fight seemed imminent. Svidrigailov was chosen to decide the dispute. He listened to them for a quarter of an hour, but they shouted so loud that there was no possibility of understanding them. The only fact that seemed certain was that one of them had stolen something and had even succeeded in selling it on the spot to a Jew, but would not share the spoil with his companion. Finally it appeared that the stolen object was a teaspoon belonging to the Vauxhall. It was missed, and the affair began to seem troublesome. Svidrigailov paid for the spoon, got up, and walked out of the garden. It was about six o'clock. He hadn't drunk a drop of wine all this time, and had ordered tea more for the sake of appearances than anything. It was a dark and stifling evening. Threatening storm clouds came over the sky about ten o'clock. There was a clap of thunder, and the rain came down like a waterfall. The water fell not in drops, but beat on the earth in streams. There were flashes of lightning every minute and each flash lasted while one could count five. Drenched to the skin, he went home, locked himself in, opened the bureau, took out all his money, and tore up two or three papers. Then, putting the money in his pocket, he was about to change his clothes, but looking out of the window and listening to the thunder and the rain, he gave up the idea, took up his hat, and went out of the room without locking the door. He went straight to Sonia. She was at home. She was not alone. The four Kapenyomov children were with her. She was giving them tea. She received Svidrigailov in respectful silence, looking wonderingly at his soaking clothes. The children all ran away at once, in indescribable terror. Svidrigailov sat down at the table and asked Sonia to sit beside him. She timidly prepared to listen. I may be going to America, Sofia Semyonovna, said Svidrigailov, and as I am probably seeing you for the last time, I have come to make some arrangements. Well, did you see the lady today? I know what she said to you, you need not tell me. Sonia made a movement and blushed. Those people have their own way of doing things. As to your sisters and your brother, they are really provided for in the money assigned to them I've put into safekeeping, and have received acknowledgments. You had better take charge of the receipts in case anything happens. Here, take them. Well, now that's settled. Here are three five-percent bonds to the value of three thousand roubles. Take those for yourself, entirely for yourself. And let that be strictly between ourselves, so that no one knows of it, whatever you hear. 
he will need the money. For to go on living in the old way, Sofia Semyonovna, is bad. And besides, there is no need for it now. I am so much indebted to you, and so are the children and my stepmother, said Sonia hurriedly. And if I've said so little, please don't consider— That's enough. That's enough. But as for the money, Arkady Ivanovich, I am very grateful to you, but I don't need it now. I can always earn my own living. Don't think me ungrateful. If you are so charitable, that money— It's for you. For you, Sofia Semyonovna, and please don't waste words over it. I haven't time for it. You will want it. Rodion Romanovich has two alternatives. A bullet in the brain or Siberia. Sonia looked wildly at him and started. Don't be uneasy. I know all about it from himself, and I am not a gossip. I won't tell anyone. It was good advice when you told him to give himself up and confess. It would be much better for him. Well, if it turns out to be Siberia, he will go and you will follow him. That's so, isn't it? And if so, you'll need money. You'll need it for him, do you understand? Giving it to you is the same as my giving it to him. Besides, you've promised Amalia Ivanovna to pay what's owing. I heard you. How can you undertake such obligations so heedlessly, Sofia Semyonovna? It was Katerina Ivanovna's debt and not yours. So you ought not to have taken any notice of the German woman. You can't get through the world like that. If you are ever questioned about me, tomorrow or the day after you will be asked, don't say anything about my coming to see you now, and don't show the money to anyone or say a word about it. Well, now, goodbye. He got up. My greetings to Rodion Romanovich. By the way, you'd better put the money for the present in Mr. Razumikhin's keeping. You know Mr. Razumikhin? Of course you do. He's not a bad fellow. Take it to him tomorrow or when the time comes. And till then, hide it carefully. Sonia, too, jumped up from her chair and looked in dismay at Svidrigailov. She longed to speak, to ask a question. But for the first moments she didn't dare and didn't know how to begin. How can you... How can you be going now in such rain? Why, be starting for America and be stopped by rain? <laughs> Goodbye, Sofia Semyonovna, my dear. Live and live long. You will be of use to others. By the way, tell Mr. Razumihin I send my greetings to him. Tell him, Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov sends his greetings. Be sure to. He went out, leaving Sonia in a state of wondering anxiety and vague apprehension. It appeared afterwards that on the same evening at twenty past eleven he made another very eccentric and unexpected visit. The rain still persisted. Drenched to the skin, he walked into the little flat where the parents of his betrothed lived in Third Street in Vasilyevsky Island. He knocked some time before he was admitted, and his visit at first caused great perturbation. But Svidrigailov could be very fascinating when he liked, so that the first, and indeed very intelligent, surmise of the sensible parents that Svidrigailov had probably had so much to drink that he didn't know what he was doing vanished immediately. The decrepit father was wheeled in to see Svidrigailov by the tender and sensible mother, who, as usual, began the conversation with various irrelevant questions. She never asked a direct question, but began by smiling and rubbing her hands, and then, if she were obliged to ascertain something, for instance, when Svidrigailov would like to have the wedding, she would begin by interested and almost eager questions about Paris and the court life there and only by degrees brought the conversation round to Third Street. 
On other occasions this had, of course, been very impressive, but this time Arkady Ivanovitch seemed particularly impatient and insisted on seeing his betrothed at once, though he had been informed, to begin with, that she had already gone to bed. The girl, of course, appeared. Svidrigailov informed her at once that he was obliged, by very important affairs, to leave Petersburg for a time, and therefore brought her fifteen thousand roubles, and begged her to accept them as a present from him, as he had long been intending to make her this trifling present before their wedding. The logical connection of the present with his immediate departure, and the absolute necessity of visiting them for that purpose in pouring rain at midnight, was not made clear. But it all went off very well. Even the inevitable ejaculations of wonder and regret, the inevitable questions were extraordinarily few and restrained. On the other hand, the gratitude expressed was most glowing, and was reinforced by tears from the most sensible of mothers. Svidrigailov got up, laughed, kissed his betrothed, patted her cheek, declared he would soon come back, and noticing in her eyes, together with childish curiosity, a sort of earnest, dumb inquiry, reflected and kissed her again, though he felt sincere anger inwardly at the thought that his present would be immediately locked up in the keeping of the most sensible of mothers. He went away, leaving them all in a state of extraordinary excitement. But the tender mamma, speaking quietly in a half-whisper, settled some of the most important of their doubts, concluding that Svidrigailov was a great man, a man of great affairs and connections and of great wealth. There was no knowing what he had in his mind. He would start off on a journey and give away money just as the fancy took him, so that there was nothing surprising about it. Of course it was strange that he was wet through, but Englishmen, for instance, are even more eccentric, and all these people of high society didn't think of what was said of them and didn't stand on ceremony. Possibly, indeed, he came like that on purpose, to show that he was not afraid of anyone. Above all, not a word should be said about it, for God knows what might come of it, and the money must be locked up, and it was most fortunate that Fyodosia, the cook, had not left the kitchen. And above all, not a word must be said to that old cat, Madame Reslich, and so on and so on. They sat up whispering till two o'clock, but the girl went to bed much earlier, amazed and rather sorrowful. Svidrigailov, meanwhile, exactly at midnight, crossed the bridge on the way back to the mainland. The rain had ceased, and there was a roaring wind, he began shivering, and for one moment he gazed at the black waters of the little Neva with a look of special interest, even inquiry. But he soon felt it very cold, standing by the water. He turned and went towards Y Prospect. He walked along that endless street for a long time, almost half an hour, more than once stumbling in the dark on the wooden pavement, but continually looking for something on the right side of the street. He had noticed passing through this street lately that there was a hotel somewhere towards the end, built of wood but fairly large, and its name, he remembered, was something like Adrianople. He was not mistaken. The hotel was so conspicuous in that God-forsaken place that he couldn't fail to see it even in the dark. It was a long, blackened wooden building, and in spite of the late hour, there were lights in the windows and signs of life within. He went in and asked a ragged fellow who met him in the corridor for a room. The latter, scanning Svidrigailov, pulled himself together and led him at once to a close and tiny room in the distance at the end of the corridor under the stairs. There was no other. All were occupied. The ragged fellow looked inquiringly. "'Is there tea?' asked Fidrigailov. Yes, sir. What else is there? Veal, vodka, savouries? Bring me tea and veal. And you want 
Nothing else? he asked with apparent surprise. Nothing. Nothing. The ragged man went away, completely disillusioned. It must be a nice place, thought Svidrigailov. How was it I didn't know it? I expect I look as if I came from a café chantant, and have had some adventure on the way. It would be interesting to know who stayed here. He lighted the candle and looked at the room more carefully. It was a room so low-pitched that Svidrigailov could not only just stand up in it. It had one window. The bed, which was very dirty, and the plain, stained chair and table almost filled it up. The walls looked as though they were made of planks, covered with shabby paper, so torn and dusty that the pattern was indistinguishable, though the general color, yellow, could still be made out. One of the walls was cut short by the sloping ceiling, though the room was not an attic, but just under the stairs. Svidrigailov set down the candle, sat down on the bed, and sank into thought. But a strange, persistent murmur, which sometimes rose to a shout in the next room, attracted his attention. The murmur had not ceased from the moment he entered the room. He listened. Someone was upbraiding and almost tearfully scolding, but he heard only one voice. Svidrigailov got up, shaded the light with his hand, and at once he saw light through a crack in the wall. He went up and peeped through. The room, which was somewhat larger than his, had two occupants. One of them, a very curly-headed man with a red inflamed face, was standing in the pose of an orator without his coat, with his legs wide apart to preserve his balance, and smiting himself on the breast. He reproached the other with being a beggar, with having no standing whatever. He declared that he had taken the other out of the gutter, and he could turn him out when he liked, and that only the finger of Providence sees it all. The object of his reproaches was sitting in a chair, and had the air of a man who wants dreadfully to sneeze but can't. He sometimes turned sheepish and befogged eyes on the speaker, but obviously had not the slightest idea what he was talking about, and scarcely heard it. A candle was burning down on the table. There were wine glasses, a nearly empty bottle of vodka, bread and cucumber, and glasses with the dregs of stale tea. After gazing attentively at this, Svidrigailov turned away indifferently, and sat down on the bed. The ragged attendant, returning with the tea, could not resist asking him again whether he didn't want anything more, and again receiving a negative reply, finally withdrew. Svidrigailov made haste to drink a glass of tea to warm himself, but couldn't eat anything. He began to feel feverish. He took off his coat, and, wrapping himself in the blanket, lay down on the bed. He was annoyed. It would have been better to be well for the occasion, he thought with a smile. The room was close. The candle burnt dimly. The wind was roaring outside. He heard a mouse scratching in the corner, and the room smelt of mice and of leather. He lay in a sort of reverie. One thought followed another. He felt a longing to fix his imagination on something. It must be a garden under the window, he thought. There's a sound of trees. How I dislike the sound of trees on a stormy night in the dark. They give one a horrid feeling. He remembered how he had disliked it when he passed Petrovsky Park just now. This reminded him of the bridge over the little Neva, and he felt cold again as he had when standing there. I never have liked water, he thought, even in a landscape. And he suddenly smiled again at a strange idea. Surely now all these questions of taste and comfort ought not to matter. But I've become more particular, like an animal that picks out a special place for such an occasion. I ought to have gone into the Petrovsky Park. I suppose it seemed dark, cold, 
<laughs> as though I were seeking pleasant sensations. By the way, why haven't I put out the candle? He blew it out. They've gone to bed next door, he thought, not seeing the light at the crack. Well now, Marfa Petrovna, now is the time for you to turn up. It's dark, and the very time and place for you. But now you won't come. He suddenly recalled how, an hour before carrying out his design on Dunya, he had recommended Raskolnikov to trust her to Razumikhin's keeping. I suppose I really did say it, as Raskolnikov guessed, to tease myself. But what a rogue that Raskolnikov is. He's gone through a good deal. He may be a successful rogue in time when he's got over his nonsense, but now he's too eager for life. These young men are contemptible on that point. But hang the fellow. Let him please himself. It's nothing to do with me. He couldn't get to sleep. By degrees, Dunya's image rose before him, and a shudder ran over him. No, I must give up all that now, he thought, rousing himself. I must think of something else. It's queer and funny. I never had a great hatred for anyone. I never particularly desired to revenge myself even, and that's a bad sign, a bad sign, a bad sign. I never liked quarrelling either. I never lost my temper. That's a bad sign, too. And the promises I made her just now, too. Damnation! But who knows? Perhaps she would have made a new man of me somehow. He ground his teeth and sank into silence again. Again Dunya's image rose before him, just as she was when... After shooting the first time, she had lowered the revolver in terror and gazed blankly at him, so that he might have seized her twice over and she would not have lifted a hand to defend herself if he had not reminded her. He recalled how at that instant he felt almost sorry for her, how he had felt a pang at his heart. Ay, damnation, these thoughts again, I must put it away. He was dozing off. The feverish shiver had ceased, when suddenly something seemed to run over his arm and leg under the bedclothes. He started. Ugh, hang it! I believe it's a mouse, he thought. That's the veal I left on the table. He felt fearfully disinclined to pull off the blanket, get up, get cold, but all at once something unpleasant ran over his leg again. He pulled off the blanket and lighted the candle. Shaking with feverish chill, he bent down to examine the bed. There was nothing. He shook the blanket, and suddenly a mouse jumped out on the sheet. He tried to catch it, but the mouse ran to and fro in zigzags without leaving the bed, slipped between his fingers, ran over his hand, and suddenly darted under the pillow. He threw down the pillow, but in one instant felt something leap on his chest and dart over his body and down his back under his shirt. He trembled nervously and woke up. This ends Disc 19. Crime and Punishment, Disc 20. The room was dark. He was lying on the bed and wrapped up in the blanket as before. The wind was howling under the window. How disgusting, he thought with annoyance. He got up and sat on the edge of the bedstead with his back to the window. It's better not to sleep at all, he decided. There was a cold, damp draft from the window, however. Without getting up, he drew the blanket over him and wrapped himself in it. He wasn't thinking of anything and didn't want to think. But one image rose after another, incoherent scraps of thought without beginning or end passed through his mind. He sank into drowsiness. Perhaps the cold, or the dampness, or the dark, or the wind that howled under the window and tossed the trees roused a sort of persistent craving for the fantastic. 
he kept dwelling on images of flowers. He fancied a charming flower garden, a bright, warm, almost hot day, a holiday, Trinity Day. A fine, sumptuous country cottage in the English taste, overgrown with fragrant flowers, with flower beds going round the house, the porch, wreathed in climbers, were surrounded with beds of roses. A light, cool staircase, carpeted with rich rugs, was decorated with rare plants and china pots. He noticed particularly in the windows nosegays of tender, white, heavily fragrant narcissus bending over their bright, green, thick, long stalks. He was reluctant to move away from them, but he went up the stairs and came into a large, high drawing-room, and again everywhere, at the windows, the doors, on to the balcony, and on the balcony itself, were flowers. The floors were strewn with freshly cut fragrant hay. The windows were open, a fresh, cool, light air came into the room. The birds were chirruping under the window, and in the middle of the room, on a table covered with a white satin shroud, stood a coffin. The coffin was covered with white silk and edged with a thick white frill. Wreaths of flowers surrounded it on all sides. Among the flowers lay a girl in a white muslin dress, with her arms crossed and pressed on her bosom, as though carved out of marble. But her loose fair hair was wet. There was a wreath of roses on her head. The stern and already rigid profile of her face looked as though chiseled of marble too, and the smile on her pale lips was full of an immense unchildish misery and sorrowful appeal. Svidrigailov knew that girl. There was no holy image, no burning candle beside the coffin, no sound of prayers. The girl had drowned herself. She was only fourteen, but her heart was broken, and she had destroyed herself, crushed by an insult that had appalled and amazed that childish soul, had smirched that angel purity with unmerited disgrace, and torn from her a last scream of despair, unheeded and brutally disregarded, on a dark night in the cold and wet, while the wind howled. Svidrigailov came to himself, got up from the bed and went to the window. He felt for the latch and opened it. The wind lashed furiously into the little room and stung his face and his chest, only covered with his shirt as though with frost. Under the window there must have been something like a garden, and apparently a pleasure garden. There, too, probably, there were tea-tables, and singing in the daytime. Now drops of rain flew in at the window from the trees and bushes. It was dark as in a cellar, so that he could only just make out some dark blurs of objects. Svidrigailov, bending down with elbows on the window-sill, gazed for five minutes into the darkness. The boom of a cannon, followed by a second one, resounded in the darkness of the night. Ah, the signal! The river is overflowing, he thought. By morning it will be swirling down the street in the lower parts, flooding the basements and cellars. The cellar rats will swim out, and men will curse in the rain and wind as they drag their rubbish to their upper stories. What time is it now? And he had hardly thought it when, somewhere near, a clock on the wall ticking away hurriedly struck three. Ah! It will be light in an hour. Why wait? I'll go out at once straight to the park. I'll choose a great bush there drenched with rain— so that as soon as one's shoulder touches it, millions of drops drip on one's head. He moved away from the window, shut it, lighted the candle, put on his waistcoat, his overcoat and his hat, and went out, carrying the candle into the passage to look for the ragged attendant, 
who would be asleep somewhere in the midst of candle ends and all sorts of rubbish, to pay him for the room and leave the hotel. It's the best minute. I couldn't choose a better. He walked for some time through a long, narrow corridor, without finding anyone, and was just going to call out, when suddenly, in a dark corner between an old cupboard and the door, he caught sight of a strange object which seemed to be alive. He bent down with the candle and saw a little girl, not more than five years old, shivering and crying with her clothes as wet as a soaking house flannel. She didn't seem afraid of Svidrigailov, but looked at him with blank amazement out of her big black eyes. Now and then she sobbed, as children do when they have been crying a long time, but are beginning to be comforted. The child's face was pale and tired. She was numb with cold. How can she have come here? She must have hidden here and not slept all night. He began questioning her. The child, suddenly becoming animated, chattered away in her baby language something about Mammy and that Mammy would beat her and about some cup that she had woken. The child chattered on without stopping. He could only guess from what she said that she was a neglected child whose mother, probably a drunken cook in the service of the hotel, whipped and frightened her, that the child had broken a cup of her mother's and was so frightened that she had run away the evening before, had hidden for a long while somewhere outside in the rain, at last had made her way in here, hidden behind the cupboard, and spent the night there, crying and trembling from the damp, the darkness, and the fear that she would be badly beaten for it. He took her in his arms, went back to his room, sat her on the bed, and began undressing her. The torn shoes which she had on her stockingless feet, were as wet as if they had been standing in a puddle all night. When he had undressed her, he put her on the bed, covered her up, and wrapped her in the blanket from her head downwards. She fell asleep at once. Then he sank into dreary musing again. What folly to trouble myself! he decided suddenly, with an oppressive feeling of annoyance. What idiocy! In vexation, he took up the candle to go and look for the ragged attendant again, and make haste to go away. Damn the child! he thought as he opened the door. But he turned again to see whether the child was asleep. He raised the blanket carefully. The child was sleeping soundly. She had got warm under the blanket, and her pale cheeks were flushed. But strange to say, that flush seemed brighter and coarser than the rosy cheeks of childhood. It's a flush of fever, thought Svidrigailov. It was like the flush from drinking, as though she had been given a full glass to drink. Her crimson lips were hot and glowing. But what was this? He suddenly fancied that her long black eyelashes were quivering, as though the lids were opening and a sly, crafty eye peeped out with an unchildlike wink, as though the little girl were not asleep, but pretending. Yes, it was so. Her lips parted in a smile. The corners of her mouth quivered, as though she were trying to control them but now she quite gave up all effort. Now it was a grin, a broad grin. There was something shameless, provocative in that quiet, unchildish face. It was depravity. It was the face of a harlot, the shameless face of a French harlot. Now both eyes opened wide. They turned a glowing, shameless glance upon him. They laughed, invited him. There was something infinitely hideous and shocking in that laugh, in those eyes, in such nastiness in the face of a child. What, at five years old? Svidrigailov muttered in genuine horror. What does it mean? And now she turned to him, 
her little face all aglow, holding out her arms. "'Accursed child!' Svidrigailov cried, raising his hand to strike her, but at that moment he woke up. He was in the same bed, still wrapped in the blanket. The candle had not been lighted, and daylight was streaming in at the windows. "'I've had nightmare all night!' He got up angrily, feeling utterly shattered. His bones ached. There was a thick mist outside, and he could see nothing. It was nearly five. He had overslept himself. He got up, put on his still damp jacket and overcoat. Feeling the revolver in his pocket, he took it out, and then he sat down, took a notebook out of his pocket, and in the most conspicuous place on the title page wrote a few lines in large letters. Reading them over, he sank into thought with his elbows on the table. The revolver and the notebook lay beside him. Some flies woke up and settled on the untouched veal, which was still on the table. He stared at them, and at last with his free right hand began trying to catch one. He tried till he was tired, but couldn't catch it. At last, realizing that he was engaged in this interesting pursuit, he started, got up, and walked resolutely out of the room. A minute later he was in the street. A thick, milky mist hung over the town. Svidrigailov walked along the slippery, dirty wooden pavement towards the little Neva. He was picturing the waters of the little Neva, swollen in the night. Petrovsky Island, the wet paths, the wet grass, the wet trees and bushes, and at last, the bush. He began ill-humouredly, staring at the houses, trying to think of something else. There was not a cabman or a passerby in the street. The bright yellow, wooden little houses looked dirty and dejected with their closed shutters. The cold and damp penetrated his whole body, and he began to shiver. From time to time he came across shop signs and read each carefully. At last he reached the end of the wooden pavement and came to a big stone house. A dirty, shivering dog crossed his path with its tail between its legs. A man in a great coat lay face downwards, dead drunk across the pavement. He looked at him and went on. A high tower stood up on the left. Bah! he thought. Here is a place. Why should it be Petrovsky? It will be in the presence of an official witness anyway. He almost smiled at this new thought and turned into the street, where there was the big house with the tower. At the great closed gates of the house, a little man stood with his shoulder leaning against them, wrapped in a grey soldier's coat, with a copper Achilles helmet on his head. He cast a drowsy and indifferent glance at Svidrigailov. His face wore that perpetual look of peevish dejection, which is so sourly printed on all faces of Jewish race without exception. They both, Svidrigailov and Achilles, stared at each other for a few minutes without speaking. At last it struck Achilles as irregular for a man not drunk to be standing three steps from him, staring and not saying a word. "'What do you want here?' he said without moving or changing his position. "'Nothing, brother. Good morning,' answered Svidrigailov. "'This isn't the place.' "'I am going to foreign parts, brother.' To foreign parts? To America. America! Svidrigailov took out the revolver and cocked it. Achilles raised his eyebrows. I say this is not the place for such jokes. Why shouldn't it be the place? Because it isn't. Well, brother, I don't mind that. It's a good place. When you are asked, you just say he was going, he said, to America. He put the revolver to his right temple. "'You can't do it here. It's not the place!' cried Achilles, rousing himself, his eyes growing bigger and bigger. Svidrigailov pulled the trigger. Chapter 7 The same day, about seven o'clock in the evening, Raskolnikov was on his way to his mother's and sister's lodging, 
the lodging in Bakaleyev's house, which Razumikhin had found for them. The stairs went up from the street. Raskolnikov walked with lagging steps, as though still hesitating whether to go or not. But nothing would have turned him back. His decision was taken. Besides, it doesn't matter. They still know nothing, he thought. And they are used to thinking of me as eccentric. He was appallingly dressed. His clothes, torn and dirty, soaked with a night's rain. His face was almost distorted from fatigue, exposure, the inward conflict that had lasted for twenty-four hours. He had spent all the previous night alone, God knows where. But anyway, he had reached a decision. He knocked at the door which was opened by his mother. Dunya was not at home. Even the servant happened to be out. At first Pulcheria Alexandrovna was speechless with joy and surprise. Then she took him by the hand and drew him into the room. "'Here you are,' she began, faltering with joy. "'Don't be angry with me, Rodya, for welcoming you so foolishly with tears. I am laughing, not crying. Did you think I was crying? No, I am delighted. But I've got into such a stupid habit of shedding tears. I've been like that ever since your father's death. I cry for anything.' "'Sit down, dear boy, you must be tired. I see you are. Ah, how muddy you are!' "'I was in the rain yesterday, mother,' Raskolnikov began. "'No, no,' Pulcheria Alexandrovna hurriedly interrupted. "'You thought I was going to cross-question you in the womanish way I used to. Don't be anxious. I understand. I understand it all. Now I've learned the ways here, and truly I see for myself that they are better. I've made up my mind once for all.' How could I understand your plans and expect you to give an account of them? God knows what concerns and plans you may have, or what ideas you are hatching. So it's not for me to keep nudging your elbow, asking you what you are thinking about. But, my goodness, why am I running to and fro as though I were crazy? I am reading your article in the magazine for the third time, Rodya. Dmitri Prokofitch brought it to me. Directly I saw it. I cried out to myself, there, foolish one, I thought, that's what he is busy about. That's the solution of the mystery. Learned people are always like that. He may have some new ideas in his head just now. He is thinking them over, and I worry him and upset him. I read it, my dear, and, of course, there was a great deal I didn't understand, but that's only natural. How should I? Show me, mother. Raskolnikov took the magazine and glanced at his article. Incongruous as it was with his mood and his circumstances, he felt that strange and bitter sweet sensation that every author experiences the first time he sees himself in print. Besides, he was only twenty-three. It lasted only a moment. After reading a few lines, he frowned, and his heart throbbed with anguish. He recalled all the inward conflict of the preceding months. He flung the article on the table with disgust and anger. But, however foolish I may be, Roger, I can see for myself that you will very soon be one of the leading, if not the leading man, in the world of Russian thought. And they dare to think you were mad. You don't know, but they really thought that. Ah, the despicable creatures! How could they understand genius? And Dunya! Dunya was all but believing it. What do you say to that? Your father sent twice to magazines the first time poems. I've got the manuscript and will show you. And the second time a whole novel. I begged him to let me copy it out. And how we prayed that they should be taken. They weren't. I was breaking my heart, Rodya, six or seven days ago over your food and your clothes and the way you are living. But now I see again how foolish I was, for you can attain any position you like by your intellect and talent. No doubt you don't care about that for the present, and you are occupied with much more important matters. Dunya's not at home, mother. No, Rodya. I often don't see her. She leaves me alone. Dmitri Prokofitch comes to see me. It's so good of him, and he always talks about you. He loves you. "'and respects you, my dear. "'I don't say that Dunya is very wanting in consideration. 
I'm not complaining. She has her ways, and I have mine. She seems to have got some secrets of late, and I never have any secrets from you two. Of course, I am sure that Dunya has far too much sense. And besides, she loves you and me. But I don't know what it will all lead to. You've made me so happy by coming now, Rodja. But she has missed you by going out. When she comes in, I'll tell her. Your brother came in while you were out. Where have you been all this time? You mustn't spoil me, Rodja, you know. Come when you can, but if you can't, it doesn't matter. I can wait. I shall know, anyway, that you are fond of me. That will be enough for me. I shall read what you write. I shall hear about you from everyone. And sometimes you'll come yourself to see me. What could be better? Here you've come now to comfort your mother. I see that. Here Porcheria Alexandrovna began to cry. Here I am again. Don't mind my foolishness. My goodness, why am I sitting here? She cried, jumping up. There is coffee, and I don't offer you any. Ah, that's the selfishness of old age. I'll get it at once. Mother, don't trouble. I'm going at once. I haven't come for that. Please listen to me. Pulcheria Alexandrovna went up to him timidly. Mother, whatever happens, whatever you hear about me, whatever you are told about me, will you always love me as you do now? He asked suddenly from the fullness of his heart, as though not thinking of his words and not weighing them. Rodya, Rodya, what is the matter? How can you ask me such a question? Why, who will tell me anything about you? Besides, I wouldn't believe anyone. I should refuse to listen. I've come to assure you that I've always loved you. And I am glad that we are alone, even glad Dunya is out. He went on with the same impulse. I have come to tell you that though you will be unhappy, you must believe that your son loves you now more than himself. And that all you thought about me, that I was cruel and didn't care about you, was all a mistake. I shall never cease to love you. Well, that's enough. I thought I must do this and begin with this. Pulcheria Alexandrovna embraced him in silence, pressing him to her bosom and weeping gently. I don't know what is wrong with you, Rodya, she said at last. I've been thinking all this time that we were simply boring you. And now I see that there is a great sorrow in store for you, and that's why you are miserable. I've foreseen it a long time, Rodya. Forgive me for speaking about it. I keep thinking about it and lie awake at nights. Your sister lay talking in her sleep all last night, talking of nothing but you. I caught something, but I couldn't make it out. I felt all the morning as though I were going to be hanged, waiting for something, expecting something. And now it has come. Rodya. Rodya, where are you going? You are going away somewhere? Yes. That's what I thought. I can come with you, you know, if you need me. And Dunya, too, she loves you. She loves you dearly. And Sofia Semyonovna may come with us, if you like. You see, I am glad to look upon her as a daughter, even. Dmitri Prokofitch will help us to go together, but... Where are you going? Goodbye, mother. What, today? She cried, as though losing him forever. I can't stay, I must go now. And can't I come with you? No. But kneel down and pray to God for me. Your prayer perhaps will reach him. Let me bless you and sign you with the cross. That's right. That's right. Oh, God, what are we doing? Yes, he was glad, he was very glad that there was no one there, that he was alone with his mother. 
For the first time after all those awful months, his heart was softened. He fell down before her. He kissed her feet, and both wept, embracing. And she was not surprised, and didn't question him this time. For some days she had realized that something awful was happening to her son, and that now some terrible minute had come for him. "'Roger, my darling, my firstborn,' she said, sobbing. "'Now you are just as when you were little. You would run like this to me and hug me and kiss me. When your father was living and we were poor, you comforted us simply by being with us. And when I buried your father, how often we wept together at his grave and embraced as now. And if I've been crying lately, it's that my mother's heart had a foreboding of trouble. The first time I saw you, that evening, you remember, as soon as we arrived here, I guessed simply from your eyes. My heart sank at once. And today, when I opened the door and looked at you, I thought the fatal hour had come. Rodya. Rodya, you are not going away today. No. You'll come again? Yes. I'll come. Rodya, don't be angry. I don't dare to question you. I know I mustn't. Only say two words to me. Is it far where you are going? Very far. What is awaiting you there? Some post or career for you? What God sends. Only pray for me. Raskolnikov went to the door, but she clutched him and gazed despairingly into his eyes. Her face worked with terror. Enough, mother, said Raskolnikov, deeply regretting that he had come. Not forever. It's not yet forever. You'll come. You'll come tomorrow. I will. I will. Goodbye. He tore himself away at last. It was a warm, fresh, bright evening. It had cleared up in the morning. Raskolnikov went to his lodgings. He made haste. He wanted to finish all before sunset. He didn't want to meet anyone till then. Going up the stairs, he noticed that Nastasya rushed from the samovar to watch him intently. Can anyone have come to see me? he wondered. He had a disgusted vision of Porfiry. But opening his door, he saw Dunya. She was sitting alone, plunged in deep thought, and looked as though she had been waiting a long time. He stopped short in the doorway. She rose from the sofa in dismay and stood up facing him. Her eyes, fixed upon him, betrayed horror and infinite grief. And from those eyes alone, he saw at once that she knew. "'Am I to come in or go away?' he asked uncertainly. "'I've been all day with Sofia Semyonovna. "'We were both waiting for you. "'We thought that you would be sure to come there.' Raskolnikov went into the room and sank exhausted on a chair. "'I feel weak, Dunya. "'I am very tired. "'And I should have liked at this moment to be able to control myself.' "'He glanced at her mistrustfully.' Where were you all night? I don't remember clearly. You see, sister, I wanted to make up my mind once for all. And several times I walked by the Nyuva. I remember that I wanted to end it all there, but I couldn't make up my mind, he whispered, looking at her mistrustfully again. Thank God. That was just what we were afraid of, Sofia Semyonovna and I. And you still have faith in life? Thank God! Thank God! Raskolnikov smiled bitterly. I haven't faith, but I have just been weeping in Mother's arms. I haven't faith, but I have just asked her to pray for me. I don't know how it is, Dunya. I don't understand it. Have you been at Mother's? Have you told her? cried Dunya, horror-stricken. Surely you haven't done that? No. I didn't tell her. In words. But she understood a great deal. She heard you talking in your sleep. 
I'm sure she half understands it already. Perhaps I did wrong in going to see her. I don't know why I did go. I am a contemptible person, Dunya. A contemptible person, but ready to face suffering. You are, aren't you? Yes. I am going at once. Yes, to escape the disgrace I thought of drowning myself, Dunya, but as I looked into the water I thought that if I had considered myself strong till now I'd better not be afraid of disgrace, he said, hurrying on. It's pride, Dunya. Pride, Roja. There was a gleam of fire in his lusterless eyes. He seemed to be glad to think that he was still proud. You don't think, sister, that I was simply afraid of the water? He asked, looking into her face with a sinister smile. Oh, Vrodya, hush! cried Dunya bitterly. Silence lasted for two minutes. He sat with his eyes fixed on the floor. Dunya stood at the other end of the table and looked at him with anguish. Suddenly he got up. It's late, it's time to go. I'm going at once to give myself up, but I don't know why I am going to give myself up. Big tears fell down her cheeks. You are crying, sister, but can you hold out your hand to me? You doubted it? She threw her arms around him. Aren't you half expiating your crime by facing the suffering? She cried, holding him close and kissing him. Crime? What crime? He cried in sudden fury. That I killed a vile, noxious insect, an old pawnbroker woman of use to no one. Killing her was atonement for forty sins. She was sucking the life out of poor people. Was that a crime? I am not thinking of it, and I am not thinking of expiating it. And why are you all rubbing it in on all sides? A crime, a crime. Only now do I see clearly the full depth of my mean spiritedness, now that I've already decided to accept this unnecessary shame. Just because I am worthless and have no talent, maybe also for my own advantage, as Porfiry suggested. Brother, brother, what are you saying? Why, you have shed blood, cried Dunya in despair. Which all men shed, he put in almost frantically. Which flows and has always flowed in streams which is spilt like champagne, and for which men are crowned in the capital, and are called afterwards benefactors of mankind. Look into it more carefully, and understand it. I, too, wanted to do good to men, and would have done hundreds, thousands of good deeds to make up for that one piece of stupidity, not stupidity even, simply clumsiness, for the idea was by no means so stupid as it seems now that it has failed." Everything seems stupid when it fails. By that stupidity I only wanted to put myself into an independent position, to take the first step, to obtain means, and then everything would have been smoothed over by benefits immeasurable in comparison. But I... I couldn't carry out even the first step, because I am contemptible. That's what's the matter." and yet I won't look at it as you do. If I had succeeded, I should have been crowned with glory, but now I'm trapped. But that's not so, not so. Brother, what are you saying? Ah, it's not picturesque, not aesthetically attractive. I fail to understand why bombarding people by regular siege is more honorable. The fear of appearances is the first symptom of impotence. I've never, never recognized this more clearly than now, and I am further than ever from seeing that what I did was a crime. I have never, never been stronger and more convinced than now." The color had rushed into his pale, exhausted face. But as he uttered his last explanation he happened to meet Dunya's eyes, and he saw such anguish in them that he couldn't help being checked. He felt that he had anyway made these two poor women miserable, that he was anyway the cause. Dunya, darling, if I am guilty, forgive me, though I cannot be forgiven if I am guilty. Goodbye.
We won't dispute. It's time, high time to go. Don't follow me, I beseech you. I have somewhere else to go. But you go at once and sit with Mother. I entreat you to. It's my last request of you. Don't leave her at all. I left her in a state of anxiety that she is not fit to bear. She will die or go out of her mind. Be with her. Razumichin will be with you. I have been talking to him. Don't cry about me. I'll try to be honest and manly all my life, even if I am a murderer. Perhaps I shall some day make a name. I won't disgrace you, you will see. I'll still show... Now, good-bye for the present, he concluded hurriedly, noticing again a strange expression in Dunya's eyes at his last words and promises. Why are you crying? Don't cry, don't cry, we are not parting for ever. Ah, yes, wait a minute, I'd forgotten. He went to the table, took up a thick, dusty book, opened it, and took from between the pages a little watercolour portrait on ivory. It was the portrait of his landlady's daughter, who had died of fever, that strange girl who had wanted to be a nun. For a minute he gazed at the delicate, expressive face of his betrothed, kissed the portrait, and gave it to Dunya. I used to talk a great deal about it to her, only to her, he said thoughtfully. To her heart I confided much of what has since been so hideously realized. Don't be uneasy, he returned to Dunya. She was as much opposed to it as you, and I'm glad that she's gone. The great point is that everything now is going to be different. It's going to be broken in two, he cried, suddenly returning to his dejection. Everything. Everything. And am I prepared for it? Do I want it myself? They say it's necessary for me to suffer. What's the object of these senseless sufferings? Shall I know any better what they are for when I am crushed by hardships and idiocy, and weak as an old man after twenty years' penal servitude? And what shall I have to live for then? Why am I consenting to that life now? Oh, I knew I was contemptible when I stood looking at the Neva at daybreak today. At last they both went out. It was hard for Dunya, but she loved him. She walked away, but after going fifty paces, she turned round to look at him again. He was still in sight. At the corner he too turned, and for the last time their eyes met. But noticing that she was looking at him, he motioned her away with impatience and even vexation and turned the corner abruptly. "'I am wicked, I see that,' he thought to himself, feeling ashamed a moment later of his angry gesture to Dunya. "'But why are they so fond of me if I don't deserve it? "'Oh, if only I were alone and no one loved me, "'and I too had never loved anyone. "'Nothing of all this would have happened.' But I wonder, shall I in those fifteen or twenty years grow so meek that I shall humble myself before people and whimper at every word that I am a criminal? Yes, that's it, that's it. That's what they are sending me there for. That's what they want. Look at them running to and fro about the streets, every one of them a scoundrel and a criminal at heart, and worse, still an idiot. But try to get me off, and they'd be wild with righteous indignation. Oh, I hate them all. He fell to musing by what process it could come to pass that he could be humbled before all of them indiscriminately, humbled by conviction. And yet why not? It must be so. Would not twenty years of continual bondage crush him utterly? Water wears out a stone. And why, why should he live after that? Why should he go now, when he knew that it would be so? It was the hundredth time, perhaps, that he had asked himself that question since the previous evening. But still, he went. Chapter 6 
Chapter 8 When he went into Sonia's room, it was already getting dark. All day Sonia had been waiting for him in terrible anxiety. Dunya had been waiting with her. She had come to her that morning remembering Svidrigailov's words that Sonia knew. We will not describe the conversation and tears of the two girls and how friendly they became. Dunya gained one comfort at least from that interview, that her brother would not be alone. He had gone to her, Sonia, first with his confession. He had gone to her for human fellowship when he needed it. She would go with him wherever fate might send him. Dunya didn't ask, but she knew it was so. She looked at Sonia almost with reverence, and at first almost embarrassed her by it. Sonia was almost on the point of tears. She felt herself, on the contrary, hardly worthy to look at Dunya, Dunya's gracious image when she had bowed to her so attentively and respectfully at their first meeting in Raskolnikov's room, had remained in her mind as one of the fairest visions of her life. Dunya at last became impatient, and, leaving Sonia, went to her brother's room to await him there. She kept thinking that he would come there first. When she had gone, Sonia began to be tortured by the dread of his committing suicide, and Dunya too feared it. But they had spent the day trying to persuade each other that that could not be, and both were less anxious while they were together. As soon as they parted, each thought of nothing else. Sonia remembered how Svidrigailov had said to her the day before that Raskolnikov had two alternatives, Siberia or... Besides, she knew his vanity, his pride, and his lack of faith. Is it possible that he has nothing but cowardice and fear of death to make him live? She thought at last in despair. Meanwhile the sun was setting. Sonia was standing in dejection, looking intently out of the window, but from it she could see nothing but the unwhitewashed blank wall of the next house. At last, when she began to feel sure of his death, he walked into the room. She gave a cry of joy, but looking carefully into his face, she turned pale. Yes, said Raskolnikov, smiling. I have come for your cross, Sonia. It was you told me to go to the crossroads. Why is it you are frightened now it's come to that? Sonia gazed at him astonished. His tone seemed strange to her. A cold shiver ran over her. But in a moment she guessed that the tone and the words were a mask. He spoke to her, looking away as though to avoid meeting her eyes. You see, Sonia, I've decided that it will be better so... There is one fact, but it's a long story and there's no need to discuss it. But do you know what angers me? It annoys me that all those stupid, brutish faces will be gaping at me directly, pestering me with their stupid questions which I shall have to answer. They'll point their fingers at me. Phew! You know, I am not going to Porfiry. I am sick of him. I'd rather go to my friend the explosive lieutenant. How I shall surprise him! What a sensation I shall make! But I must be cooler. I've become too irritable of late. You know, I was nearly shaking my fist at my sister just now because she turned to take a last look at me. It's a brutal state to be in. Ah, what am I coming to? Well, where are the crosses? He seemed hardly to know what he was doing. He couldn't stay still or concentrate his attention on anything. His ideas seemed to gallop after one another. He talked incoherently. His hands trembled slightly. Without a word, Sonia took out of the drawer two crosses, one of cypress wood and one of copper. She made the sign of the cross over herself and over him and put the wooden cross on his neck. "'It's the symbol of my taking up the cross,' he laughed, "'as though I had not suffered much till now.' The wooden cross, that is the peasant one, the copper one, that is Lizaveta's, you will weigh yourself. Show me. So she had it on at that moment. 
I remember two things like these, too, a silver one and a little icon. I threw them back on the old woman's neck. Those would be appropriate now, really. Those are what I ought to put on now. But I am talking nonsense and forgetting what matters. I am somehow forgetful. You see, I have come to warn you, Sonia, so that you might know. That's all. That's all I came for. But I thought I had more to say. You wanted me to go yourself. Well, now I am going to prison, and you'll have your wish. Well, what are you crying for? You too don't. Leave off. Oh, how I hate it all. But his feeling was stirred. His heart ached as he looked at her. Why is she grieving too? he thought to himself. What am I to her? Why does she weep? Why is she looking after me like my mother or Dunya? She'll be my nurse. Cross yourself. Say at least one prayer, Sonya begged in a timid, broken voice. Oh, certainly, as much as you like. And sincerely, Sonya, sincerely. But he wanted to say something quite different. He crossed himself several times. Sonia took up her shawl and put it over her head. It was the green drap du dame shawl of which Marmeladov had spoken. The family shawl. Raskolnikov thought of that, looking at it, but he didn't ask. He began to feel himself that he was certainly forgetting things and was disgustingly agitated. He was frightened at this. He was suddenly struck, too, by the thought that Sonia meant to go with him. "'What are you doing? Where are you going? Stay here! Stay! I'll go alone!' he cried in cowardly vexation, and almost resentful he moved towards the door. "'What's the use of going in procession?' he muttered, going out. Sonia remained standing in the middle of the room. He had not even said good-bye to her. He had forgotten her. A poignant and rebellious doubt surged in his heart. Was it right? Was it right, all this? He thought again as he went down the stairs. Couldn't he stop and retract it all, and not go? But still he went. He felt suddenly, once for all, that he mustn't ask himself questions. As he turned into the street, he remembered that he had not said good-bye to Sonia, that he had left her in the middle of the room in her green shawl, not daring to stir after he had shouted at her, and he stopped short for a moment. At the same instant, another thought dawned upon him, as though it had been lying in wait to strike him then. Why, for what reason did I go to her just now? I told her, on business, on what business? I had no sort of business. To tell her I was going, but where was the need? Do I love her? No. No, I drove her away just now like a dog. Did I want her crosses? Oh, how low I've sunk. No, I wanted her tears. I wanted to see her terror, to see how her heart ached. I had to have something to cling to, something to delay me, some friendly face to see. And I dared to believe in myself, to dream of what I would do. I am a beggarly contemptible wretch. Contemptible! He walked along the canal bank, and he had not much further to go. But on reaching the bridge he stopped, and turning out of his way along it went to the haymarket. He looked eagerly to right and left, gazed intently at every object, and could not fix his attention on anything. Everything slipped away. In another week, another month, I shall be driven in a prison van over this bridge. How shall I look at the canal then? I should like to remember this. Slipped into his mind. Look at this sign. How shall I read those letters then? It's written here, Company. That's a thing to remember, that letter A, and to look at it again in a month. How shall I look at it then? What shall I be feeling and thinking then? How trivial it all must be, what I am fretting about now. Of course, it must all be interesting in its way. <laughs> what am I thinking about? I am becoming a baby. I am showing off to myself. 
Why am I ashamed? Oh, how people shove that fat man, a German he must be, who pushed against me. Does he know whom he pushed? There's a peasant woman with a baby, begging. It's curious that she thinks me happier than she is. I might give her something for the incongruity of it. Here's a five kopeck piece left in my pocket. Where did I get it? Here, here, take it, my good woman. God bless you, the beggar chanted in a lachrymose voice. He went into the haymarket. It was distasteful, very distasteful to be in a crowd, but he walked just where he saw most people. He would have given anything in the world to be alone. But he knew himself that he would not have remained alone for a moment. There was a man drunk and disorderly in the crowd. He kept trying to dance and falling down. There was a ring round him. Raskolnikov squeezed his way through the crowd, stared for some minutes at the drunken man, and suddenly gave a short, jerky laugh. A minute later he had forgotten him, and didn't see him, though he still stared. He moved away at last, not remembering where he was. But when he got into the middle of the square, an emotion suddenly came over him, overwhelming him, body and mind. He suddenly recalled Sonia's words, Go to the crossroads, bow down to the people, kiss the earth, for you have sinned against it too, and say aloud to the whole world, I am a murderer. He trembled, remembering that. And the hopeless misery and anxiety of all that time, especially of the last hours, had weighed so heavily upon him that he positively clutched at the chance of this new, unmixed, complete sensation. It came over him like a fit. It was like a single spark kindled in his soul and spreading fire through him. Everything in him softened at once, and the tears started into his eyes. He fell to the earth on the spot. He knelt down in the middle of the square, bowed down to the earth, and kissed that filthy earth with bliss and rapture. He got up and bowed down a second time. He's boozed, a youth near him observed. There was a roar of laughter. He's going to Jerusalem, brothers, and saying goodbye to his children and his country. He's bowing down to all the world and kissing the great city of St. Petersburg and its pavement, added a workman who was a little drunk. Quite a young man, too, observed a third. And a gentleman, someone observed soberly. There's no knowing who's a gentleman and who isn't nowadays. These exclamations and remarks checked Raskolnikov. And the words, I am a murderer, which were perhaps on the point of dropping from his lips, died away. He bore these remarks quietly, however, and without looking round he turned down a street leading to the police office. He had a glimpse of something on the way which didn't surprise him. He had felt that it must be so. The second time he bowed down in the haymarket, he saw, standing fifty paces from him on the left, Sonia. She was hiding from him behind one of the wooden shanties in the marketplace. She had followed him then on his painful way. Raskolnikov at that moment felt and knew once for all that Sonia was with him forever and would follow him to the ends of the earth wherever fate might take him. It wrung his heart. But he was just reaching the fatal place. He went into the yard fairly resolutely. He had to mount to the third story. I should be some time going up, he thought. He felt as though the fateful moment was still far off, as though he had plenty of time left for consideration. Again the same rubbish, the same eggshells lying about on the spiral stairs, again the open doors of the flats, again the same kitchens, and the same fumes and stench coming from them. Raskolnikov had not been here since that day. His legs were numb and gave way under him, but still they moved forward. He stopped for a moment to take breath, to collect himself, so as to enter like a man. But why? What for? He wondered, reflecting. 
If I must drink the cup, what difference does it make? The more revolting, the better. He imagined for an instant the figure of the explosive lieutenant, Ilya Petrovitch. Was he actually going to him? Couldn't he go to someone else? To Nikodim Fomich? Couldn't he turn back and go straight to Nikodim Fomich's lodgings? At least then it would be done privately. No, no. To the explosive lieutenant. If he must drink it, drink it off at once. Turning cold and hardly conscious, he opened the door of the office. There were very few people in it this time, only a house porter and a peasant. The doorkeeper did not even peep out from behind his screen. Raskolnikov walked into the next room. Perhaps I still need not speak, passed through his mind. Some sort of clerk not wearing a uniform was settling himself at a bureau to write. In a corner another clerk was seating himself. Zamyetov was not there, nor, of course, Nikodim Fomich. "'No one in?' Raskolnikov asked, addressing the person at the bureau. "'Whom do you want?' "'Ah! Not a sound was heard, not a sight was seen, but I sent the Russian—' "'How does it go on in the fairy tale? I've forgotten. At your service!' The familiar voice cried suddenly. Raskolnikov shuddered. The explosive lieutenant stood before him. He had just come in from the third room. It is the hand of fate, thought Raskolnikov. Why is he here? You've come to see us. What about? cried Ilya Petrovitch. He was obviously in an exceedingly good humor and perhaps a trifle exhilarated. If it's on business, you are rather early. It's only a chance that I am here. However, I'll do what I can. I must admit I... What is it? What is it? Excuse me. Raskolnikov. Of course, Raskolnikov. You didn't imagine I'd forgotten. Don't think I am like that. Rodion... Ro... Ro... Rodionovich, that's it, isn't it? Rodion Romanovich. Yes, yes, of course, Rodion Romanovich. I was just getting at it. I made many inquiries about you. I assure you I've been genuinely grieved since that... since I behaved like that. It was explained to me afterwards that you were a literary man, and a learned one, too. And so to say, the first steps... Mercy on us! What literary or scientific man does not begin by some originality of conduct? My wife and I have the greatest respect for literature. In my wife it's a genuine passion. Literature and art. If only a man is a gentleman... All the rest can be gained by talents, learning, good sense, genius. As for a hat, well, what does a hat matter? I can buy a hat as easily as I can a bun. But what's under the hat? What the hat covers, I can't buy that. I was even meaning to come and apologize to you, but thought maybe you'd... But I am forgetting to ask you, is there anything you want, really? I hear your family have come. Yes, my mother and sister. I've even had the honor and happiness of meeting your sister, a highly cultivated and charming person. I confess I was sorry I got so hot with you. There it is. But as for my looking suspiciously at your fainting fit, that affair has been cleared up splendidly. Bigotry and fanaticism. I understand your indignation. Perhaps you are changing your lodging on account of your family's arriving? No. I only looked in... I came to ask... I thought that I should find Zamyatov here. Oh, yes, of course you've made friends, I heard. Well, no, Zamyatov is not here. Yes, we've lost Zamyatov. He's not been here since yesterday. He quarreled with everyone on leaving, in the rudest way. He is a feather-headed youngster, that's all. One might have expected something from him, but there, you know what they are, our brilliant young men. He wanted to go in for some examination, but it's only to talk and boast about it. It will go no further than that. Of course, it's a very different matter with you or Mr. Razumikhin there, your friend. Your career is an intellectual one, and you won't be deterred by failure. For you, one may say, all the attractions of life nihil est. You are an ascetic, a monk, a hermit. A book, a pen behind your ear, a learned research, that's where your spirit soars— I am the same way myself. Have you read Livingstone's travels? No. Oh, I have. There are a great many nihilists about nowadays, you know, and indeed it is not to be wondered at. 
What sort of days are they, I ask you? But we thought, you are not a nihilist, of course. Answer me openly. Openly. N no. Believe me, you can speak openly to me as you would to yourself. Official duty is one thing, but... You are thinking I meant to say friendship is quite another. No, you're wrong. It's not friendship, but the feeling of a man and a citizen. The feeling of humanity and of love for the Almighty. I may be an official, but I am always bound to feel myself a man and a citizen. You were asking about Zamyatov. Zamyatov will make a scandal in the French style in a house of bad reputation over a glass of champagne. That's all your Zamyatov is good for. While I'm perhaps, so to speak, burning with devotion and lofty feelings, and besides I have rank, consequence, a post, I am married and have children. I fulfill the duties of a man and a citizen, but who is he, may I ask? I appeal to you as a man ennobled by education. Then these midwives, too, have become extraordinarily numerous. Raskolnikov raised his eyebrows inquiringly. The words of Ilya Petrovitch, who had obviously been dining, were for the most part a stream of empty sounds for him. But some of them he understood. He looked at him inquiringly, not knowing how it would end. "'I mean those crop-headed wenches,' the talkative Ilya Petrovitch continued. "'Midwives is my name for them. I think it a very satisfactory one. <laughs> they go to the academy, study anatomy.' "'If I fall ill, am I to send for a young lady to treat me? "'What do you say? Ha-ha!' <laughs> Ilya Petrovitch laughed, quite pleased with his own wit. "'It's an immoderate zeal for education, but once you're educated, that's enough. "'Why abuse it? "'Why insult honourable people, as that scoundrel Zamyatov does? "'Why did he insult me, I ask you? "'Look at these suicides, too, how common they are, you can't fancy.' People spend their last halfpenny and kill themselves, boys and girls and old people. Only this morning we heard about a gentleman who had just come to town. Neil Pavlich, I say. What was the name of that gentleman who shot himself? Svidrigailov, someone answered from the other room with drowsy listlessness. Raskolnikov started. Svidrigailov? Svidrigailov has shot himself? he cried. What? Do you know Svidrigailov? Yes. I knew him. He hadn't been here long. Yes, it's so. He had lost his wife, was a man of reckless habits, and all of a sudden shot himself, and in such a shocking way. He left in his notebook a few words, that he dies in full possession of his faculties, and that no one is to blame for his death. He had money, they say. How did you come to know him? I was acquainted. My sister was governess in his family. Ah, bah, bah, then no doubt you can tell us something about him. You had no suspicion? I saw him yesterday. He was drinking wine. I knew nothing. Raskolnikov felt as though something had fallen on him and was stifling him. You've turned pale again. It's so stuffy here. Yes. I... "'Must go,' muttered Raskolnikov. "'Excuse my troubling you.' "'Oh, not at all. As often as you like. It's a pleasure to see you, and I am glad to say so.' Ilya Petrovitch held out his hand. "'I only wanted... I came to see Zamyatov. "'I understand, I understand, and it's a pleasure to see you. "'I am very glad. Good-bye.' Raskolnikov smiled. He went out. He reeled. He was overtaken with giddiness and didn't know what he was doing. He began going down the stairs, supporting himself with his right hand against the wall. He fancied that a porter pushed past him on his way upstairs to the police office, that a dog in the lower story kept up a shrill barking, and that a woman flung a rolling pin at it and shouted. He went down and out into the yard. There... Not far from the entrance stood Sonia, pale and horror-stricken. She looked wildly at him. He stood still before her. There was a look of poignant agony, of despair in her face. She clasped her hands. His lips worked in an ugly, meaningless smile. He stood still a minute, grinned, 
and went back to the police office. Ilya Petrovitch had sat down and was rummaging among some papers. Before him stood the same peasant who had pushed by on the stairs. Hello! Back again! Have you left something behind? What's the matter? Raskolnikov, with white lips and staring eyes, came slowly nearer. He walked right to the table, leaned his hand on it, tried to say something, but could not. Only incoherent sounds were audible. You are feeling ill. A chair. Here, sit down. Some water. Raskolnikov dropped onto a chair, but he kept his eyes fixed on the face of Ilya Petrovitch, which expressed unpleasant surprise. Both looked at one another for a minute and waited. Water was brought. It was I, began Raskolnikov. Drink some water. Raskolnikov refused the water with his hand, and softly and brokenly but distinctly said, It was I killed the old pawnbroker woman and her sister Lizaveta, with an axe, and robbed them. <sighs> Ilya Petrovitch opened his mouth. People ran up on all sides. Raskolnikov repeated his statement. This ends Disc 20. Crime and Punishment, Disc 21 Epilogue Chapter 1 Siberia On the banks of a broad solitary river stands a town, one of the administrative centers of Russia. In the town there is a fortress. In the fortress there is a prison. In the prison, the second-class convict Radion Raskolnikov has been confined for nine months. Almost a year and a half has passed since his crime. There had been little difficulty about his trial. The criminal adhered exactly, firmly, and clearly to his statement. He didn't confuse nor misrepresent the facts, nor soften them in his own interest, nor omit the smallest detail. He explained every incident of the murder, the secret of the pledge, the piece of wood with a strip of metal, which was found in the murdered woman's hand. He described minutely how he had taken her keys, what they were like, as well as the chest and its contents. He explained the mystery of Lizaveta's murder, described how Koch and, after him, the student, knocked and repeated all they had said to one another, how he afterwards had run downstairs and heard Nikolai and Dmitri shouting, how he had hidden in the empty flat and afterwards gone home. He ended by indicating the stone in the yard off the Vosnesensky prospect under which the purse and the trinkets were found. The whole thing, in fact, was perfectly clear. The lawyers and the judges were very much struck, among other things, by the fact that he had hidden the trinkets and the purse under a stone without making use of them, and that, what was more, he didn't now remember what the trinkets were like, or even how many there were. The fact that he had never opened the purse, and did not even know how much was in it, seemed incredible. There turned out to be in the purse three hundred and seventeen roubles and sixty kopecks. From being so long under the stone, some of the most valuable notes, lying uppermost, had suffered from the damp. They were a long while trying to discover why the accused man should tell a lie about this, when about everything else he had made a truthful and straightforward confession. Finally, some of the lawyers more versed in psychology admitted that it was possible he had really not looked into the purse and so didn't know what was in it when he hid it under the stone. But they immediately drew the deduction that the crime could only have been committed through temporary mental derangement, through homicidal mania, without object or the pursuit of gain. 
This fell in with the most recent fashionable theory of temporary insanity so often applied in our days in criminal cases. Moreover, Raskolnikov's hypochondriacal condition was proved by many witnesses, by Dr. Zosimov, his former fellow students, his landlady, and her servant. All this pointed strongly to the conclusion that Raskolnikov was not quite like an ordinary murderer and robber, but that there was another element in the case. To the intense annoyance of those who maintained this opinion, the criminal scarcely attempted to defend himself. To the decisive question as to what motive impelled him to the murder and the robbery, he answered very clearly, with the coarsest frankness, that the cause was his miserable position, his poverty and helplessness, and his desire to provide for his first steps in life by the help of the three thousand roubles he had reckoned on finding. He had been led to the murder through his shallow and cowardly nature, exasperated, moreover, by privation and failure. To the question, what led him to confess, he answered that it was his heartfelt repentance. All this was almost coarse. The sentence, however, was more merciful than could have been expected, perhaps partly because the criminal had not tried to justify himself, but had rather shown a desire to exaggerate his guilt. All the strange and peculiar circumstances of the crime were taken into consideration. There could be no doubt of the abnormal and poverty-stricken condition of the criminal at the time. The fact that he had made no use of what he had stolen was put down partly to the effect of remorse, partly to his abnormal mental condition at the time of the crime. Incidentally, the murder of Lizaveta served indeed to confirm the last hypothesis. A man commits two murders and forgets that the door is open. Finally, the confession at the very moment when the case was hopelessly muddled by the false evidence given by Nikolai through melancholy and fanaticism, and when, moreover, there were no proofs against the real criminal, no suspicions even, Porfiry Petrovitch fully kept his word. All this did much to soften the sentence. Other circumstances, too, in the prisoner's favor, came out quite unexpectedly. Razumihin somehow discovered and proved that while Raskolnikov was at the university, he had helped a poor consumptive fellow student and had spent his last penny on supporting him for six months. And when this student died, leaving a decrepit old father whom he had maintained almost from his thirteenth year, Raskolnikov had got the old man into a hospital and paid for his funeral when he died. Raskolnikov's landlady bore witness, too, that when they had lived in another house at five corners, Raskolnikov had rescued two little children from a house on fire, and was burnt in doing so. This was investigated, and fairly well confirmed by many witnesses. These facts made an impression in his favor. And in the end, the criminal was, in consideration of extenuating circumstances, condemned to penal servitude in the second class, for a term of eight years only. At the very beginning of the trial, Raskolnikov's mother fell ill. Dunya and Razumihin found it possible to get her out of Petersburg during the trial. Razumihin chose a town on the railway, not far from Petersburg, so as to be able to follow every step of the trial, and, at the same time, to see Avdotya Romanovna as often as possible. Pulcheria Alexandrovna's illness was a strange nervous one, and was accompanied by a partial derangement of her intellect. When Dunya returned from her last interview with her brother, she had found her mother already ill, in feverish delirium. That evening Razumihin and she agreed what answers they must make to her mother's questions about Raskolnikov, and made up a complete story for her mother's benefit of his having to go away to a distant part of Russia on a business commission, which would bring him in the end money and reputation. But they were struck by the fact that Pulcheria Alexandrovna never asked them anything on the subject, neither then 
nor thereafter. On the contrary, she had her own version of her son's sudden departure. She told them with tears how he had come to say goodbye to her, hinting that she alone knew many mysterious and important facts, and that Rodya had many very powerful enemies, so that it was necessary for him to be in hiding. As for his future career, she had no doubt that it would be brilliant when certain sinister influences could be removed. She assured Razumikhin that her son would be one day a great statesman, that his article and brilliant literary talent proved it. This article she was continually reading. She even read it aloud, almost took it to bed with her, but scarcely asked where Rodya was, though the subject was obviously avoided by the others, which might have been enough to awaken her suspicions. They began to be frightened at last at Pulcheria Alexandrovna's strange silence on certain subjects. She did not, for instance, complain of getting no letters from him, though in previous years she had only lived on the hope of letters from her beloved Rodya. This was the cause of great uneasiness to Dunya. The idea occurred to her that her mother suspected that there was something terrible in her son's fate and was afraid to ask, for fear of hearing something still more awful. In any case, Dunya saw clearly that her mother was not in full possession of her faculties. It happened once or twice, however, that Pulcheria Alexandrovna gave such a turn to the conversation that it was impossible to answer her without mentioning where Rodya was and on receiving unsatisfactory and suspicious answers, she became at once gloomy and silent. And this mood lasted for a long time. Dunya saw at last that it was hard to deceive her, and came to the conclusion that it was better to be absolutely silent on certain points. But it became more and more evident that the poor mother suspected something terrible. Dunya remembered her brother's telling her that her mother had overheard her talking in her sleep on the night after her interview with Svidrigailov, and before the fatal day of the confession. Had not she made out something from that? Sometimes days and even weeks of gloomy silence and tears would be succeeded by a period of hysterical animation, and the invalid would begin to talk almost incessantly of her son, of her hopes, of his future. Her fancies were sometimes very strange. They humored her, pretended to agree with her. She saw, perhaps, that they were pretending. But she still went on talking. Five months after Raskolnikov's confession, he was sentenced. Razumikhin and Sonia saw him in prison as often as it was possible. At last the moment of separation came. Dunya swore to her brother that the separation should not be for ever, Razumikhin did the same. Razumikhin, in his youthful ardor, had firmly resolved to lay the foundations at least of a secure livelihood during the next three or four years, and saving up a certain sum to emigrate to Siberia, a country rich in every natural resource and in need of workers, active men, and capital. There they would settle, in the town where Rodya was, and all together would begin a new life. They all wept at parting. Raskolnikov had been very dreamy for a few days before. He asked a great deal about his mother and was constantly anxious about her. He worried so much about her that it alarmed Dunya. When he heard about his mother's illness, he became very gloomy. With Sonia he was particularly reserved all the time. With the help of the money left to her by Svidrigailov, Sonia had long ago made her preparations to follow the party of convicts in which he was dispatched to Siberia. Not a word passed between Raskolnikov and her on the subject, but both knew it would be so. At the final leave-taking, he smiled strangely at his sister's and Razumikhin's fervent anticipations of their happy future together when he should come out of prison. He predicted that their mother's illness would soon have a fatal ending. 
Sonia and he at last set off. Two months later, Dunya was married to Razumikhin. It was a quiet and sorrowful wedding. Porfiry Petrovich and Zosimov were invited, however. During all this period, Razumikhin wore an air of resolute determination. Dunya put implicit faith in his carrying out his plans, and, indeed, she could not but believe in him. He displayed a rare strength of will. Among other things, he began attending university lectures again in order to take his degree. They were continually making plans for the future. Both counted on settling in Siberia within five years at least. Till then, they rested their hopes on Sonia. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was delighted to give her blessing to Dunya's marriage with Razumikhin, but after the marriage she became even more melancholy and anxious. To give her pleasure, Razumikhin told her how Raskolnikov had looked after the poor student and his decrepit father, and how a year ago he had been burnt and injured in rescuing two little children from a fire. These two pieces of news excited Pulcheria Alexandrovna's disordered imagination almost to ecstasy. She was continually talking about them, even entering into conversation with strangers in the street, though Dunya always accompanied her. In public conveyances and shops, wherever she could capture a listener, she would begin the discourse about her son, his article, how he had helped the student, how he had been burnt at the fire, and so on. Dunya didn't know how to restrain her. Apart from the danger of her morbid excitement, there was the risk of someone's recalling Raskolnikov's name and speaking of the recent trial. Pulcheria Alexandrovna found out the address of the mother of the two children her son had saved, and insisted on going to see her. At last her restlessness reached an extreme point. She would sometimes begin to cry suddenly, and was often ill and feverishly delirious. One morning she declared that by her reckoning Rodya ought soon to be home, that she remembered when he said goodbye to her he said that they must expect him back in nine months. She began to prepare for his coming, began to do up her room for him, to clean the furniture, to wash and put up new hangings, and so on. Dunya was anxious, but said nothing, and helped her to arrange the room. After a fatiguing day spent in continual fancies, in joyful daydreams and tears, Pulcheria Alexandrovna was taken ill in the night, and by morning she was feverish and delirious. It was brain fever. She died within a fortnight. In her delirium she dropped words which showed that she knew a great deal more about her son's terrible fate than they had supposed. For a long time Raskolnikov did not know of his mother's death, though a regular correspondence had been maintained from the time he reached Siberia. It was carried on by means of Sonia, who wrote every month to the Razumikhins and received an answer with unfailing regularity. At first they found Sonia's letters dry and unsatisfactory, but later on they came to the conclusion that the letters could not be better, for from these letters they received a complete picture of their unfortunate brother's life. Sonia's letters were full of the most matter-of-fact detail, the simplest and clearest description of all Raskolnikov's surroundings as a convict. There was no word of her own hopes, no conjecture as to the future, no description of her feelings. Instead of any attempt to interpret his state of mind and inner life, she gave the simple facts, that is, his own words, an exact account of his health, what he asked for at their interviews, what commission he gave her, and so on. All these facts she gave with extraordinary minuteness. The picture of their unhappy brother stood out at last with great clearness and precision. There could be no mistake, because nothing was given but facts. But Dunya and her husband could get little comfort out of the news, especially at first. Sonia wrote that he was constantly sullen and not ready to talk, 
that he scarcely seemed interested in the news she gave him from their letters, that he sometimes asked after his mother, and that when, seeing that he had guessed the truth, she told him at last of her death, she was surprised to find that he did not seem greatly affected by it, not externally at any rate. She told them that, although he seemed so wrapped up in himself and, as it were, shut himself off from everyone, he took a very direct and simple view of his new life, that he understood his position, expected nothing better for the time, had no ill-founded hopes, as is so common in his position, and scarcely seemed surprised at anything in his surroundings so unlike anything he had known before. She wrote that his health was satisfactory. He did his work without shirking or seeking to do more. He was almost indifferent about food, but except on Sundays and holidays the food was so bad that at last he had been glad to accept some money from her, Sonia, to have his own tea every day. He begged her not to trouble about anything else, declaring that all this fuss about him only annoyed him. Sonia wrote further that in prison he shared the same room with the rest, that she had not seen the inside of their barracks but concluded that they were crowded, miserable, and unhealthy, that he slept on a plank bed with a rug under him, and was unwilling to make any other arrangement, but that he lived so poorly and roughly, not from any plan or design, but simply from inattention and indifference. Sonia wrote simply that he had at first shown no interest in her visits, had almost been vexed with her indeed for coming, unwilling to talk and rude to her, but that in the end these visits had become a habit and almost a necessity for him, so that he was positively distressed when she was ill for some days and could not visit him. She used to see him on holidays at the prison gates or in the guardroom, to which he was brought for a few minutes to see her. On working days she would go to see him at work, either at the workshops or at the brick kilns, or at the sheds on the banks of the Irtish. About herself, Sonia wrote that she had succeeded in making some acquaintances in the town, that she did sewing, and as there was scarcely a dressmaker in the town, she was looked upon as an indispensable person in many houses but she did not mention that the authorities were, through her, interested in Raskolnikov, that his task was lightened, and so on. At last the news came. Dunya had indeed noticed signs of alarm and uneasiness in the preceding letters, that he held aloof from everyone, that his fellow prisoners did not like him, that he kept silent for days at a time and was becoming very pale. In the last letter... Sonia wrote that he had been taken very seriously ill and was in the convict ward of the hospital. Chapter 2 He was ill a long time. But it was not the horrors of prison life, not the hard labor, the bad food, the shaven head, or the patched clothes that crushed him. What did he care for all those trials and hardships? He was even glad of the hard work. Physically exhausted, he could at least reckon on a few hours of quiet sleep. And what was the food to him, the thin cabbage soup with beetles floating in it? In the past, as a student, he had often not had even that. His clothes were warm and suited to his manner of life. He did not even feel the fetters. Was he ashamed of his shaven head and party-colored coat? Before whom? Before Sonia? Sonia was afraid of him. How could he be ashamed before her? And yet he was ashamed, even before Sonia, whom he tortured because of it with his contemptuous rough manner. But it was not his shaven head and his fetters he was ashamed of. His pride had been stung to the quick. It was wounded pride that made him ill. Oh, how happy he would have been if he could have blamed himself. He could have borne anything then, even shame and disgrace. But he judged himself severely, and his exasperated conscience found no particularly terrible fault in his past, except a simple blunder 
which might happen to anyone. He was ashamed, just because he, Raskolnikov, had so hopelessly, stupidly come to grief through some decree of blind fate, and must humble himself and submit to the idiocy of a sentence, if he were anyhow to be at peace. Vague and objectless anxiety in the present, and in the future a continual sacrifice leading to nothing. That was all that lay before him. And what comfort was it to him that at the end of eight years he would only be thirty-two and able to begin a new life? What had he to live for? What had he to look forward to? Why should he strive to live in order to exist? Why, he had been ready a thousand times before to give up existence for the sake of an idea, for a hope, even for a fancy. Mere existence had always been too little for him. He had always wanted more. Perhaps it was just because of the strength of his desires that he had thought himself a man to whom more was permissible than to others. And if only fate would have sent him repentance, burning repentance that would have torn his heart and robbed him of sleep, that repentance, the awful agony of which brings visions of hanging or drowning, oh, he would have been glad of it. Tears and agonies would at least have been life. But he did not repent of his crime. At least he might have found relief in raging at his stupidity, as he had raged at the grotesque blunders that had brought him to prison. But now in prison, in freedom, he thought over and criticized all his actions again, and by no means found them so blundering and so grotesque as they had seemed at the fatal time. In what way? he asked himself. Was my theory stupider than others that have swarmed and clashed from the beginning of the world? One has only to look at the thing quite independently, broadly, and uninfluenced by commonplace ideas, and my idea will by no means seem so strange. Oh, skeptics and halfpenny philosophers, why do you halt halfway? Why does my action strike them as so horrible? He said to himself. Is it because it was a crime? What is meant by crime? My conscience is at rest. Of course it was a legal crime. Of course the letter of the law was broken and blood was shed. Well, punish me for the letter of the law, and that's enough. Of course, in that case... Many of the benefactors of mankind who snatched power for themselves instead of inheriting it ought to have been punished at their first steps. But those men succeeded, and so they were right. And I didn't, and so I had no right to have taken that step. It was only in that that he recognized his criminality. Only in the fact that he had been unsuccessful and had confessed it. He suffered, too, from the question, why had he not killed himself? Why had he stood looking at the river and preferred to confess? Was the desire to live so strong and was it so hard to overcome it? Had not Svidrigailov overcome it, although he was afraid of death? In misery he asked himself this question, and couldn't understand that at the very time he had been standing looking into the river, he had perhaps been dimly conscious of the fundamental falsity in himself and his convictions. He didn't understand that that consciousness might be the promise of a future crisis, of a new view of life and of his future resurrection. 
he preferred to attribute it to the dead weight of instinct which he could not step over, again through weakness and meanness. He looked at his fellow prisoners and was amazed to see how they all loved life and prized it. It seemed to him that they loved and valued life more in prison than in freedom. What terrible agonies and privations some of them, the tramps, for instance, had endured. Could they care so much for a ray of sunshine, for the primeval forest, the cold spring hidden away in some unseen spot which the tramp had marked three years before and longed to see again, as he might to see his sweetheart dreaming of the green grass round it and the birds singing in the bush. As he went on, he saw still more inexplicable examples. In prison, of course, there was a great deal he did not see and did not want to see. He lived, as it were, with downcast eyes. It was loathsome and unbearable for him to look. But in the end, there was much that surprised him. And he began, as it were involuntarily, to notice much that he had not suspected before. What surprised him most of all was the terrible, impossible gulf that lay between him and all the rest. They seemed to be a different species. And he looked at them and they at him with distrust and hostility. He felt and knew the reasons of his isolation, but he would never have admitted till then that those reasons were so deep and strong. There were some Polish exiles, political prisoners among them. They simply looked down upon all the rest as ignorant churls. But Raskolnikov could not look upon them like that. He saw that these ignorant men were in many respects far wiser than the Poles. There were some Russians who were just as contemptuous, a former officer and two seminarists. Raskolnikov saw their mistake as clearly. He was disliked and avoided by everyone. They even began to hate him at last. Why, he could not tell. Men who had been far more guilty despised and laughed at his crime. "'You're a gentleman,' they used to say. "'You shouldn't hack about with an axe. That's not a gentleman's work.' The second week in Lent, his turn came to take the sacrament with his gang. He went to church and prayed with the others. A quarrel broke out one day. He did not know how. All fell on him at once in a fury. "'You're an infidel. You don't believe in God,' they shouted. "'You ought to be killed.' He had never talked to them about God nor his belief, but they wanted to kill him as an infidel. He said nothing. One of the prisoners rushed at him in a perfect frenzy. Raskolnikov awaited him, calmly and silently. His eyebrows did not quiver, his face did not flinch. The guard succeeded in intervening between him and his assailant, or there would have been bloodshed. There was another question he could not decide. Why were they all so fond of Sonia? She didn't try to win their favor. She rarely met them. Sometimes only she came to see him at work for a moment. And yet everybody knew her. They knew that she had come out to follow him, knew how and where she lived. She never gave them money, did them no particular services. Only once at Christmas she sent them all presents of pies and rolls. But by degrees closer relations sprang up between them and Sonia. She would write and post letters for them to their relations. Relations of the prisoners who visited the town, at their instructions, left with Sonia presents and money for them. Their wives and sweethearts knew her and used to visit her. And when she visited Raskolnikov at work, or met a party of the prisoners on the road, they all took off their hats to her. Little mother, Sofya Semyonovna, you are our dear, good little mother, coarse, branded criminals said to that frail little creature. She would smile and bow to them, 
and everyone was delighted when she smiled. They even admired her gait and turned round to watch her walking. They admired her, too, for being so little, and, in fact, did not know what to admire her most for. They even came to her for help in their illnesses. He was in the hospital from the middle of Lent till after Easter. When he was better, he remembered the dreams he had had while he was feverish and delirious. He dreamt that the whole world was condemned to a terrible new strange plague that had come to Europe from the depths of Asia. All were to be destroyed, except a very few chosen. Some new sorts of microbes were attacking the bodies of men, but these microbes were endowed with intelligence and will. Men attacked by them became at once mad and furious. But never had men considered themselves so intellectual and so completely in possession of the truth as these sufferers. Never had they considered their decisions, their scientific conclusions, their moral convictions, so infallible. Whole villages, whole towns and peoples went mad from the infection. All were excited and did not understand one another. Each thought that he alone had the truth, and was wretched looking at the others, beat himself on the breast, wept and wrung his hands. They didn't know how to judge and could not agree what to consider evil and what good. They did not know whom to blame, whom to justify. Men killed each other in a sort of senseless spite. They gathered together in armies against one another, but even on the march the armies would begin attacking each other, the ranks would be broken, and the soldiers would fall on each other, stabbing and cutting, biting and devouring each other. The alarm bell was ringing all day long in the towns. Men rushed together. And why they were summoned and who was summoning them, no one knew. The most ordinary trades were abandoned because everyone proposed his own ideas, his own improvements, and they could not agree. The land, too, was abandoned. Men met in groups, agreed on something, swore to keep together, but at once began on something quite different from what they had proposed. They accused one another, fought and killed each other. There were conflagrations and famine. All men and all things were involved in destruction. The plague spread and moved further and further. Only a few men could be saved in the whole world. They were a pure chosen people, destined to found a new race and a new life, to renew and purify the earth. But no one had seen these men. No one had heard their words and their voices. It bothered Raskolnikov that this senseless piece of delirium echoed so mournfully and painfully in his memory so that for a long time the impression made by these feverish dreams did not pass. By the second week after Easter, warm, clear spring days had come. In the prison ward, the grating windows under which the sentinel paced were opened. Sonia had only been able to visit him twice during his illness. Each time she had to obtain permission, and it was difficult. But she often used to come to the hospital yard, especially in the evening, sometimes only to stand a minute and look up at the windows of the ward. One evening, when he was almost well again, Raskolnikov fell asleep. On waking up he chanced to go to the window, and at once saw Sonia in the distance at the hospital gate. She seemed to be waiting for someone. Something stabbed him to the heart at that minute. He shuddered and moved away from the window. Next day, Sonia did not come, nor the day after. He noticed that he was expecting her uneasily. At last he was discharged. On reaching the prison, he learned from the convicts that Sofia Semyonovna was lying ill at home and was unable to go out. He was very uneasy and sent to inquire after her. He soon learned that her illness was not dangerous. Hearing that he was anxious about her, Sonia sent him a penciled note, telling him 
that she was much better, that she had a slight cold, and that she would soon, very soon, come and see him at his work. His heart throbbed painfully as he read it. Again it was a warm, bright day. Early in the morning, at six o'clock, he went off to work on the river bank, where they used to pound alabaster, and where there was a kiln for baking it in a shed. There were only three of them sent. One of the convicts went with the guard to the fortress to fetch a tool. The other began getting the wood ready and laying it in the kiln. Raskolnikov came out of the shed onto the river bank, sat down on a heap of logs by the shed, and began gazing at the wide, deserted river. From the high bank a broad landscape opened before him. The sound of singing floated faintly audible from the other bank. In the vast steppe, bathed in sunshine, he could just see, like black specks, the nomads' tents. There there was freedom. There other men were living, utterly unlike those here. There time itself seemed to stand still, as though the age of Abraham and his flocks had not passed. Raskolnikov sat, gazing. His thoughts passed into daydreams, into contemplation. He thought of nothing but a vague restlessness excited and troubled him. Suddenly he found Sonya beside him. She had come up noiselessly and sat down at his side. It was still quite early. The morning chill was still keen. She wore her poor old burnous and the green shawl. Her face still showed signs of illness. It was thinner and paler. She gave him a joyful smile of welcome, but held out her hand with her usual timidity. She was always timid of holding out her hand to him, and sometimes didn't offer it at all, as though afraid he would repel it. He always took her hand as though with repugnance, always seemed vexed to meet her, and was sometimes obstinately silent throughout her visit. Sometimes she trembled before him and went away deeply grieved. But now their hands did not part. He stole a rapid glance at her and dropped his eyes on the ground without speaking. They were alone. No one had seen them. The guard had turned away for the time. How it happened... He didn't know. But all at once something seemed to seize him and fling him at her feet. He wept and threw his arms round her knees. For the first instant she was terribly frightened and she turned pale. She jumped up and looked at him trembling. But at the same moment she understood, and a light of infinite happiness came into her eyes. She knew, and had no doubt, that he loved her beyond everything, and that at last the moment had come. They wanted to speak, but could not. Tears stood in their eyes. They were both pale and thin, but those sick pale faces were bright with the dawn of a new future, of a full resurrection into a new life. They were renewed by love. The heart of each held infinite sources of life for the heart of the other. They resolved to wait and be patient. They had another seven years to wait, and what terrible suffering and what infinite happiness before them. But he had risen again, and he knew it, and felt it in all his being, while she, she only lived in his life. On the evening of the same day, when the barracks were locked, Raskolnikov lay on his plank bed and thought of her. He had even fancied that day that all the convicts who had been his enemies looked at him differently. He had even entered into talk with them, and they answered him in a friendly way. He remembered that now, and thought it was bound to be so.
wasn't everything now bound to be changed? He thought of her. He remembered how continually he had tormented her and wounded her heart. He remembered her pale and thin little face. But these recollections scarcely troubled him now. He knew with what infinite love he would now repay all her sufferings. And what were all, all the agonies of the past, everything, even his crime, his sentence and imprisonment, seemed to him now in the first rush of feeling an external, strange fact with which he had no concern. But he could not think for long together of anything that evening, and he could not have analyzed anything consciously. He was simply feeling. Life had stepped into the place of theory, and something quite different would work itself out in his mind. Under his pillow lay the New Testament. He took it up mechanically. The book belonged to Sonia. It was the one from which she had read the raising of Lazarus to him. At first he was afraid that she would worry him about religion, would talk about the gospel and pester him with books. But to his great surprise, she had not once approached the subject and had not even offered him the testament. He had asked her for it himself not long before his illness, and she brought him the book without a word. Till now he had not opened it. He did not open it now, but one thought passed through his mind— can her convictions not be mine now? Her feelings, her aspirations at least. She too had been greatly agitated that day, and at night she was taken ill again, but she was so happy, and so unexpectedly happy, that she was almost frightened of her happiness. Seven years, only seven years. At the beginning of their happiness, at some moments, they were both ready to look on those seven years as though they were seven days. He didn't know that the new life would not be given him for nothing, that he would have to pay dearly for it, that it would cost him great striving, great suffering. But that is the beginning of a new story, the story of the gradual renewal of a man the story of his gradual regeneration, of his passing from one world into another, of his initiation into a new, unknown life. That might be the subject of a new story. But our present story is ended. The End You've been listening to Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, and narrated by George Guidel. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Fathers and Sons by Ivan Turgenev, also narrated by George Guidel. And A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe, narrated by Nelson Runger. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalogue, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another recorded book, or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into narrator profiles and author interviews. So visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.